the depth of the recession, which is looming right now, is probably going to end up shallower than what we could have feared. Both the consumer as well as businesses are starting to at the margin roll over. It's still very clear that the global economy um, is in a, in, in a very weak phase. We've been the most surprised to see that the market is more optimistic than Fed commentary. Clearly now, um, you know, they have sent the signal that they are going after inflation first and foremost. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Do you think CPI Tuesday from London is a bit weird? Do you? No? Well, it is. It's a beautiful so, view, I mean, you could, you could it's say a beautiful it's weird, view. but here's that's what we're doing. From the city of London for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK Future slightly positive here. Bit of a bounce again. Four day winning streak into Tuesday. CPI just around the corner. CPI around the corner, and we've got a good, wonderful guest, Kit Jukes, to be with us in a moment with some really intelligent discussion of inflation. But, John, I'm going to suggest this is a different inflation report, all looking lower. But it is the magnitude that we could see at 8.30. It's the last big read. Bram again into the Federal Reserve decision next week. And we don't have Federal Reserve officials who are actually going to be speaking and trying to color it in any particular way because we're in the silent period. So it'll be interesting to see how markets really react, so, considering the fact that people are prepped yeah. for 75 basis points regardless. Last night over the third beverage, John said, Tom, you're in the silent period. This is the blackout period. <laughs> this is the blackout period. <laughs> how long is Jokes that Jokes aside, <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't be the first time that we had a big upside surprise on CPI and then some one kind of broke the quiet period with a little bit of a leak into a certain newspaper ahead of the decision. I'm not saying <laughs> that's going to happen this today. Early. Wow. I'm not saying that's going to happen today. I think Keep... most people are looking for a softer print, not a firmer one. So whether we see a Wall Street Journal article or not, it seems pretty clear, and I could name the actual... You uh, named the paper. I could, I, could, I could name also the, uh, the reporter, but there is a question of whether we're going to see <clears> any kind of reaction, because regardless of what right. happens, 75 basis points seems to be baked in. I think it's more interesting that despite that hawkishness, which is baked in in some markets, you're still seeing that optimism pervade equities okay. at a time when there's so much sort of uncertainty and, and concern in, on the on the peripheries. In America, we're still mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth. The King Charles will travel to Ireland today. John, a Republic of Ireland, 9.1 percent inflation. This American report at 8.30 is of global interest. Oh, without a doubt, because yeah. it sets up the monetary policy story. Though I think we should build on something we've said repeatedly over the last week or so, in fact, the last couple of months since Jackson Hole. Whether it's 50 or 75, it's kind of not the story at the moment for this Fed. Absolutely. For this Fed, the story yeah. is 2023. And all the pushback you're seeing against rate cuts from almost every single Fed official on that committee, Lisa. Yeah, and then you've got the market, which is basically saying, eh, we don't buy it. I got to say, Bank of America put out a note this morning. I saw it. And I love the title. The title was, How to Trade This Rally Even If You Don't Believe In It. It pretty much sums up where we're at. People are thinking, we hate this. We don't like this rally. It makes no sense from a fundamental perspective. But you lose not being part of it. It's about 5% over four days. I know. And we're adding to it this morning. Let's whip through some of the price action for you. Equity futures shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Equities firmer by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Yields back in by four basis points on a 10-year to 331.57. Look out at the front end. Yesterday became very close to 360 then backed away and Lisa again this morning backing away once more. Yeah, we're seeing right now the dollar, the best litmus paper. I saw this in a note that I thought was really uh, telling. The best litmus paper for the mood on inflation. And right now people seem to think inflation will be softening and accelerating uh, in that trajectory. And at 8.30 a.m., the reason why, and I'm talking Eastern time, the reason why this is a global report is because it sets up the world's biggest economy and where the price momentum is. It is the August U.S. CPI. We are watching core more than the headline CPI figure especially because it's so well known about gasoline prices. They've come down dramatically. So we're looking at, not at the headline that includes that figure, but at the rents, at other aspects of the world that are actually continuing to increase, particularly even in the United States. Today, Queen Elizabeth's coffin travels from St. Giles Cathedral to Buckingham Palace. We'll be tracking all of the proceedings. This is incredibly poignant, and it really has affected a lot of people here because this also is a woman who for 70 years led a stage through eras in which women were not as uh, recognized. And I, and I say this because she was thought of as a mother figure, a grandmother figure, but she was also very powerful. And it's really interesting to see some of the uh, tributes pour in. And at 1 p.m., the U.S. is planning to sell $18 billion of 30-year bonds. There we go. Okay, this matters. It actually matters today. Why are you okay. still wound up by See how she does I, I, that? I, I know it matters. Time, you, you know, know it matters. Well, the audience saying, know it matters. You know, because he's like, it's clockwork. You know, they always are going to sell bonds. Who cares? Some people buy them. It's not going to be disruptive. But this matters because they're actually the roll-off of the balance sheet 
sheet is starting to gain momentum. So is there going to be a much smaller pool of investors willing to swoop in, especially as real yields rise to some of the highest levels since 2018? It okay. matters. I know I'm, I'm getting kind of like, you know. I, I just, you know. Whew. Kit Jukes is with us. It's going to be calm. It matters. Chief FX strategist at Sock Gen. Kit, I think she got you. decent sleep last night, finally. You think? I think so. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe a few hours short. Kit, good to see you. <laughs> CPI just around the corner. Walk us through what you and the team are looking for a little bit later. Well, you know, I think Lisa put it quite well in the sense that, you know, the headline's bound to come down. So, so kind of, so what? The, the core, I think, could be sort of pernicious because the main feature of the US economy right now is that it's doing better than anybody thought it would be doing now, six months ago. This cycle is persisting. The labor market's still incredibly tight. The, the ISM data is still incredibly robust. We know the Fed is going to slow it. The Fed has to slow it. We just have to debate how much above 4% they have to go to slow it. And then we have to worry that if you have to slow it enough, um, you get a hard landing later. So, so the narrative at the moment is soft landing increasingly likely globally, partly mm -hmm. because of what's going on in Europe. But the, the, the difficulty for the U.S. is, and the inflation data will show this in the entrails, is the more they have to slow the economy with rate hikes now, the more the uncertain and long lags are going to come back and bite us in 2023. I was talking to our Dan Tillis this morning in London. We were talking about the makeup of inflation. The economists look at goods inflation, service inflation. You have a brilliant sentence in your note this morning that we have, don't really understand the formation of inflation, how we come about inflation this time around. What's different? Well, you know, most of, most of history, inflation is all about goods. It's all about, you know, it's wars and, and uh, pandemics and food shortages. And then it's kind of destruction of stuff and rebuilding. And then we went through the, the, the post-war period, rapid rebuilding in unionized labor without so much globalization. Now we've got a diverse labor force, a very global economy. We know we've got an, uh, an energy crisis. We know we've got some food crises. But we're, 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 we're sort of grabbing at straws of what the 70s told us about inflation, trying to understand the 2020s. A lot's changed in the way that wages are formed, in the way that people work, in the way that prices get decided. So we know there's a lot of inflation now because uh, there's too much money taking too few goods, there's too few people doing too many services. So, so we have inflation now. But how that comes back to target, other than you whack the economy on the head with a big hammer, we're not sure. Well, you know, a lot of people have said the U.S. led in inflation because they led in fiscal stimulus that then had people purchasing a lot of goods at a time when the workers couldn't really uh, sustain that, right? They couldn't make the products or they couldn't actually serve them. Now, is it really shifting to Europe? Because I keep hearing about fiscal spending plans, whether it's in the United Kingdom, whether it's in the mainland, the continental Europe, as you take a look at some of these energy efforts to try to shore up household balance sheets heading into a winter. You see the with front page of the FT this Exactly, morning. talking yeah. about basically boosting some of that fiscal spending while also cutting taxes, while also facing off with a much higher rate interest regime. How do you face this off with Europe leading on the fiscal stimulus and potentially even the inflation? Well, I think I mean, part of it in Europe, but when we, what we see from the fiscal stimulus is a, um, a program to protect people from the impact of a specific energy price increase. So you're, you're effectively giving people money and giving some money to the people we import energy from so that people's available disposable income holds up enough to not slow the economy too much. Now, I think in most goods and services, we're not going to crash and burn um, you know, as a result of that, because growth is going to slow. And we saw it in the UK already. We have you know, over 5% wage growth, but you know, we, we're going to have double-digit inflation. Sure. So you know, we're, we're not going to be spend, spending like crazy um, in bars and restaurants for the next nine months. But yeah, we protect the economies. We increase the chance of a soft landing. And that, at a global level, means you know, we still have a difficult problem because we're struggling to get output back up fast enough to cope with what we've already done. Lisa mentioned the fund manager survey from Bank of America earlier this morning. Most crowded trade, long the US dollar. I think that was one of the most crowded trades going back to November 2020 when it was all about being long US tech. The move we've seen over the last few days, Kit, can you give me an idea about the durability of this move, whether it's something you can get behind? I, I think it, no, I think it tells you a lot about um, positioning, for sure. But, but there's, you know, there's a sort of a euphoric reaction to positive news from the Ukraine. So, you sure. know, the Ukraine news is, is good. But the difficulty for me now is that this is, this is really good news with higher volatility, because 
that, that both wings of the outcome of this conflict are more likely as a result of this, if that makes sense, because there will be a, re a retaliation, a reaction. So, so it's not a comfortable environment. So that the dollar can weaken, and we can sit here with people talking about soft landings, negative for the dollar, and rethink and take positions off, says we're willing to look through something which I don't think you can analyze, even as an amateur, as anything other than a vol-increasing event. Okay, Jigs, good to see you, buddy. Love to see it's you. It's been too long. Thank you. Equity futures are positive this morning. The dollar a little bit weaker once again. And Lisa, that's got to be the story for us going into CPI a couple of hours away. Yeah, the dollar is weaker as people basically say that everything is priced in, right? So if we get a stronger print, does that reverse <laughs> things? Uh, George Cervello is coming out and said, this is it. This just shows that the dollar has gone uh, overdone and that the Japanese yen is going to get back up. And, you know, you're going to see that a little bit today. You're seeing a little bit of yen strength, but we'll see. I, I can hear the doubt in your voice I, just as you I talk mean, about it. Honestly, I think Kit put it beautifully. The tail risk of Vladimir Putin actually waging a more sure. aggressive inroad as a response to potential humiliation is something I'm not hearing anything about. Because how do you even price that in, let alone gauge that out? We mentioned the front page of the Financial Times this morning, Tom, and we should talk about it through today. The Chancellor it's speaking to the this Treasury, is, yeah. referring to them yeah. formally as a finance ministry, that they were perhaps too focused on balancing the books, and now focused on growth, mm. focused on growth and perhaps or so not they say, balancing things. Well, exactly. Until there's a constraint. Do you get the pushback from the market? Yeah, and for our American audience, this is confusing. Is it Trumpian growth? Is it the growth that we hear a supply-side supply advocate like Lawrence Kudlow talks about? Is it growth like Dean Hubbard at Columbia talks about? Do we know? I don't know if we know the quality or the kind of growth policy it is. A massive spending and tax cuts. Yeah, thank Ramo, you. <laughs> with with double-digit inflation and perhaps more on the horizon. So, over to you, foreign investor. You game? <laughs> there, there we, we go. Well, that's the question, isn't it? Futures yeah. right now positive, four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. It is. <laughs> it is. Are you down it's with the brand now? You're down with I the brand. Am, you know, he's, he's slowly. He's, he's, he's loving it. He's yeah. doing it unprompted. From London, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo ukrainian forces have recaptured more than 2300 square miles in the east and south of the country so far this month that's according to president volodymyr zelensky now he said ukrainian troops are continuing to push forward meanwhile ukraine is appealing for more weapons to build on its recent success in europe natural gas prices fell for a third day to a seven-week low the European Union is pushing ahead with its market intervention plan to ease the worst energy crisis in decades. The EU wants to cut power demand and cap excessive revenue of companies producing electricity from sources other than gas. President Biden is trying to capitalize on a sudden stretch of positive economic news. His goal is to turn the Democrats' biggest political liability into an election year selling point. The Democrats' bid to retain control of both houses of Congress have been boosted by falling gas prices and signs that inflation may be easing. The latest inflation data comes out at 8.30 New York time. Goldman Sachs doesn't see China shifting its COVID-0 policy this year. In a report published today, Goldman says that stability will be prevailing a narrative in the next lead-up to, to next month's key Communist Party meeting. Now, COVID containment measures, especially around Beijing, have intensified in recent days. And UBS plans to raise a dividend for this year by 10 percent. The Swiss bank also expects share repurchases will exceed a target of $5 billion for 2022. UBS is returning excess capital to investors after calling off the $1.4 billion acquisition of U.S. robo-advisor Wealthfront. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Inflation may actually rise further in the near term. While all HICP components added to this high number, energy price inflation in the euro area is standing at close to 40 percent, illustrating the magnitude of relative price changes in the recent period. Executive board member of the ECB, Isabel Schnabel, and I have to say Isabel Schnabel has sounded rather hawkish <coughs> over the last couple of weeks or so. Going into the CPI print here, stateside futures are positive by a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are lower by four basis points on a 10-year to about 317. Backing away across the curve this morning, especially on twos as well, after coming very close yesterday 
to 360 on a two year. In the FX market, the dollar shares some weakness again. The euro some strength, Tom, 101.68 on euro dollar. I think it's real important, John, right now to go into the real yield explosion we've seen out to a positive 0.90. And discuss that yields are pushing higher, but at the same time, that calculation is the break even and the slope and the inertial force of various measurements of inflation, the so called break evens, is tangible. It well, DC, is. You've it seen is it. Lisa's been talking the about The real it, deal. Inflation expectations, oh, Grandma, she, just, know that. just rolling over. Well, yeah, and how much is that really the story behind the dollar? How much is that the story behind some of the risk appetite? People seeing maybe not it's this huge. year, but 2023. I, I think it's directly linked that you're going to start to see appetite. some sort of deceleration. The people talking yeah. more and more about, Tom, the soft landing. I haven't heard much of that. I think the question is where does inflation migrate to? We may get some of that to this morning at 8.30. But the real question is what do you do at 7%? What do you do at 6%? Five or four. Yeah, headline uh, inflation. Right now we rip up the script. Joining us now Maria Tadeo in Brussels on America and the efforts in uh, Ukraine. Maria, a spectacular article in the New York Times this morning talking of a U.S. defense attache and how we are helping Ukraine with a tactical effort of their response to the Russian invasion. From where you sit and with your reporting, how much is America and the other Western nations at war with Mr. Putin? Well, at war, officially, they're not. And they'll be very careful to tell you we're not belligerents here. We're not actively participating in this. But we all know, of course, that Ukrainian forces uh, use weapons delivered by allies who they say we have to do this because this is a country that is being attacked. Ukraine did not initiate this war. It's defending itself. And that, of course, we know that intel has been key for Ukraine. But, Tom, I think we should also remind ourselves that this battle is being fought and, to some extent, won by Ukraine. Ukrainians. They have proven to be an effective army that has been well trained since Crimea. They took the lessons from the annexation of Crimea. They have been now on the battlefield more effective than many thought. And I think at this point, in hindsight, right. you do see that a lot of the early estimates about Ukraine were wrong. This is a professional army that knows how to fight. There has to be an assumed bodies, number of bodies that Russia needs to hold territory or to readvance. It's a ginormous number. What's your working number of the size of the military Russia needs to make this work for Mr. Putin? Uh, uh, it, listen, Tom, to me, that is the key question, because if you follow Russian media at this point, especially after what happened on Saturday, they talk about how can we escalate? How do we respond uh, to this? And a lot of the talk now is, OK, we have to go from special operation to now full war. And that means conscription. That means that you have to tell Russian men you have to go and die for your country. The issue here, and this is why Vladimir Putin has been careful not to do this, is that when you're underpaid, when you've had a month training, when you were 18 and you're sitting at home watching reality TV that looks like a war and then you're told, get ready to go and fight against a professional army in Ukraine, maybe that could spark social tension. And this is why Vladimir Putin has been incredibly careful to shield the public opinion from that, to say there won't be conscription for the time being. Yeah. Maria, at the same time, you are seeing a preparation of NATO nations for more conflict with Russia. And I think about some of the German proclamations recently of their effort to become the military leader in Europe. How is that going over both domestically and within the continent, considering the history, considering that this is a huge departure from where they've been over the past few decades? Well, it's a huge departure. Of course, you know, the, the history lesson for a lot of Germans, of course, is that uh, they do not want to be a military power. This is a country that, uh, you know, very respectfully, but still has major war, war guilt. Uh, it comes up many times in many conversations uh, with German politicians. This has been a U-turn, but I think a lot of countries, neighbors, particularly in Eastern Europe, will say, I'll believe it when I see it. And I also want to see the investment. This is an army that has been underinvested for a long time. They'll believe it when they see it and they start to see money going into this army. Maria, thank you. Maria today there, out of Brussels on the latest with the war in Ukraine. It's something we've talked about a few times, Lisa, over the last couple of days is whether it actually makes a difference to policy, whether the sanctions would go away if we resolved this thing, say, tomorrow. 
Right. And basically, in a nutshell, no, it won't, right? I mean, that's pretty much consensus at this point. Nobody thinks that everything is going to be fine, that natural gas is going to start flowing through Nord Stream 1 again to uh, Germany. Not likely. However, does it potentially remove some of the tail risk, right? I mean, that's, I guess, where people are talking about in terms of the optimism. Otherwise, I can't really understand what they're talking about. And gas prices pulling back just a, a little bit. Coming up a little bit later this morning, we'll catch up with Andrew Hollenhorst, the chief U.S. economist over at Citi, as we count you down to the CPI report in a couple of hours' time. Ten, Andrew Hollenhorst nine, is looking, eight. Tom. What are you counting down to? I'm counting down. I think you've got a lot of more numbers than that seven. to count down to. It's a few hours <laughs> away. Just keep doing that for the next two hours. Count up to 75. 75 is what Andrew Hollenhorst is looking for the Fed lease well, in about know, a week. Benjamin Navarro publishes moments ago, his colleague in London, and he says this is a Bank of England the day after the Fed that will, quote, be forceful. Well, but it's really not just about what happens at the meeting next week, right? And you were saying that earlier, John and Tom, you were saying that it's going to be what happens next year. Can we really find anything out, right? I mean, this is the tricky moment because <clears throat> deceleration in some of the key inflation components doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the woods. We're still talking about an 8% headline number, potentially. And with core at 6%, sure. you're not exactly in a safe territory. Tom's still counting. I, I, is there a Greer's nearby? A Greer's? Yeah, like what, the, what the, is it you would like? the breakfast place. You want breakfast? Yeah, but you know, you've always told me it's like the place to I just, dine. I just saw you eat breakfast. We just had breakfast together. <laughs> we could, re we could re breakfast. <laughs> On air? The food here, folks, what is, is outstanding. <laughs> the coffee, even. Do we have to go home? The coffee is superb. The coffee's oh, good, eh? The coffee's good. Can I just say congratulations good. to the team that put together this set? Yeah, yeah. they did a great Late job. Late yesterday evening into early yeah. this morning. For those of you <laughs> on Bloomberg Radio. We walked in to work on the lighting. Just fantastic. We're yeah. in a hugely historic part of the city of London. This is uh, Queen Victoria Street, and behind us is a cathedral that matters to the world, St. Paul's. Just a little bit. Yeah. Very cool. Live from London. For our audience worldwide, with Tom Keane, who's going to count you down to the CPI report. To the, visit to to, to the second breakfast, and actually. Breakfast. Second breakfast. <laughs> That's and, what he's going to do. Who knows down what down else? <laughs> Future's <laughs> positive by a half Eight. of one percent. Oh Seven. This is Bloomberg. Six sausage. <laughs> a live from London. Good morning to you. Counting you down. To CPI Tuesday, the C report, a couple Tuesday. of hours away. TK is doing a live countdown clock for you. <laughs> you might hear it every now and again. <laughs> 10, 9. What number are you on now? Yeah, Set. okay. Cease. Oh, we're doing it in different languages. We're doing different languages. <laughs> okay. no. Features positive. We're causing Money s and by four tenths of 1%. Yields coming in, a couple of basis points. We're down about four. Negative four basis points on a 10 year, 331. On a 10 year, euro yeah. dollar 10161, positive four tenths of 1%. Some dollar weakness. Marco Kalanovic out there. He's bullish, Tom. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked, please. <laughs> Come on, don't ruin it. Let me go with the quote. He says this, we maintain a pro-risk stance. Economic data and investor positioning are more important factors for risky asset performance than central bank rhetoric, and the data appear to be increasingly supportive of a soft landing. Soft landing, the buzzword Soft moment, landing right? is a new it phrase. Is. It's the soft landing moment for... I'm Marco hearing more Clinton. about a soft landing than I am about a... Uh, yes, God. and that is because of the deceleration in inflation, which is the reason why you're seeing a little bit more dollar weakness and a little bit more risk appetite. The question is, is the inflation deceleration sufficient to really give people some sort of faith Misty that they're on the right track? Misty watercolored memories. Governor We've Waller, seen this before. Governor Waller says no. I'm trying to be serious. You two are killing me. <laughs> Governor Waller says well, no. <laughs> Governor Waller basically said no yeah, right yeah. I mean, last week, Tom. That. He was pushing back. Over yeah, the and he's pushed back with, with great force against uh, a number of other uh, parties. We should say, John, that this is a nation in mourning, all of this nation a bit lighter today. I, sh I think with the travels today. That's going to come and in waves, Tom, as we work our way ways, through to exactly. Monday, and, and then yeah. it's going to hit everyone over the head on yeah. Monday when we have the, the funeral service. And, and Lizzie Burden, of course, reporting for Buckingham Palace, a little bit of lightness in the last 24 hours as this nation prepares for a funeral on Monday. We prepare for a funeral for Andrew Hollenhorst, chief economist at Citigroup, if he gets the inflation call wrong. He no, has been out front incredibly bold on a move to a higher uh, interest rate regime. Andrew, not so much how important is this CPI call this morning, but how does it relate to the CPI's uh, calls to come 30, 60, and 90 days from now? 
Thanks, Tom. I think that's really the key question here is maybe not so much what exactly do we get this morning. And it's pretty widely shared expectation that we're going to have somewhat of a softer print again in August. We had a softer print for July. The question is, where is underlying inflation? And if I look at, for instance, the Atlanta Fed has a great dashboard of various underlying inflation measures. All of those inflation measures indicating above 5% inflation, some of them above 6% inflation. So I think no matter what we get this morning, and we expect some distortions from used cars and maybe airfares, if you if you look through to underlying inflationary pressure, and it kind of goes back to what you're talking about with, you know, can we get a soft landing? We have a really tight labor market. We have labor costs that are rising. That's going to th show through to higher prices. Andrew, do you think then we're still underestimating the persistence of this story and the resolve of this Federal Reserve? I, I think that's always the danger. And we went through that a year ago last summer when we saw some softer prints. And I think there was a lot of optimism that maybe we could be seeing inflation that was actually transitory. And I, I think we just have to be really careful about not letting hope triumph over the reality of the situation. We all hope for a soft landing. Certainly, I would hope that's uh, what the economy can achieve. There's a possibility of achieving that. You're going to hear Fed officials that emphasize that possibility. But it is that. It is a possibility. It is not a high probability. It's a possible outcome, an outcome that we hope for, probably not the most realistic outcome at this point. Andrew, I won't ask you to get out the crystal ball and tell me where inflation is going to be 12 months out, 18 months out. But do you have a decent idea of what the threshold is for this Federal Reserve to take a pause, to look around and say, perhaps that's enough? So what, one thing that's been useful is we've heard from a lot of Fed officials. We, of course, had Chair Powell speaking at Jackson Hole, just being really crystal clear about the resolve and the desire to bring inflation down. But then how do you operationalize that? We heard from Vice Chair Brainerd last week saying, I need to see several weaker prints, several softer inflation yep. prints. And Fed speak, several means more than a couple. So we're looking at you know more than two months. With July and August data, we may see two months of weaker inflation. So I think it's a series of weaker, softer monthly inflation prints. Um, and also very importantly that you see this broad based. And I think that's part of the lesson of the last year or more of inflation data is that you really have to look at what is the breadth of the slowdown. If this is just used cars, if it's just airfares, that's not going to be sufficient. What you want to see is services, prices that are at least not accelerating, uh, rents that are slowing down at some point, and we know house prices have slowed down. Uh, so there are reasons to think that you could see softer readings as we move into 2023, uh, but clearly not seeing that yet. I think way too early for the Fed to declare victory on this. That said, Andrew, from your vantage point, do you think, and I hate saying this because I'm going to get pilloried, but a soft landing looks more likely because of how much prices have rolled over so much more than some people had previously expected? Well, I think the issue, Lisa, is really what we were just talking about, is, is how broad is that decline in prices? We're talking about certain categories of goods, and that's maybe not that surprising given that we had really excessive demand for goods in particular. And now that that demand is moving and shifting a bit into the services sector. What, what I'm increasingly concerned about is upward price pressure for services. Now, we saw airfares that went up significantly. It looks like we'll come off of those highs, and we have come off of those highs. Maybe we'll see a decline again in that category in the report this morning. But that's really the question for me is, are, are we slowing down in a broad-based sense? If this is just gasoline prices, uh, if this is just certain goods, I, I don't know that that's sufficient to really say that underlying inflation has slowed. And then even on the good side, remember, we're talking about shortages of energy and natural gas in Europe. We're talking about a potential railroad strike later this week in the U.S. So there's still some really acute upside risk to goods inflation that I think we should also be aware of. Based on your projections and these granular components, Andrew, where do you see inflation ending next year? I mean, people are trying to game out the likelihood of getting down to a 6% handle or an 8% handle by the end of this year. What about 2023? Yeah, so no question we'll still be very elevated at the end of this year. It really is 2023 where you look for, for inflation to come off further. When we forecast out that for, far, we see a path for headline inflation, um, and various measures of core inflation to get down into the 3% range. I think that would be quite an accomplishment if the Fed was able to return inflation, which would still be above target, but you know at least a closer to target around 
The issue is that it looks to us that to get there, you will need at least a somewhat significant rise in the unemployment rate. This idea that we're going to bring down inflation and cool wages. Remember, if you look at Atlanta Fed Wage Tracker, it's running at 6.7 percent. Um, so we really have a mm -hmm. lot of pressure in, in wages. It looks hard to us to see those kind of even 3 percent inflation numbers um, without a significant loosening in labor markets. And if the dynamics and the behavioral movement from eight, nine percent inflation to five percent is a mystery, let's say it's nonlinear in some forms, the linearity that was invest, invented by Alan Greenspan of a measured path, we've almost become unmoored by that. How unmeasured are we right now? How unmeasured is our response to inflation? Yeah, it's a great way of putting it, Tom. I think quite unmeasured in the sense that. You have central banks that are trying to do two things, and this is true in the U.S., it's true globally, where on the one hand or one component of this is trying to just get policy rates up to a level that's more consistent with where inflation is running. You have right. very kind of basic back of the envelope. You usually think policy rates need to get up around the level of underlying inflation. So you're behind in that sense. That's leading to larger hikes. But then there's a second issue, which is credibility. And you're going into these meetings as central bank officials with markets looking for what you're going to do, the public looking for what you're going to do. And it's the, the messaging as well as the actual policy action. And I think that's part of why you've seen, for instance, from the Fed, a string of 75 basis point rate hikes. It's Yes, it's to, to catch up to where policy rates probably should be, um, but it's also to try to send that message. So we had Chair Powell do that at Jackson Hole through his rhetoric. I think next week at the meeting, we're going to see Fed officials try to do that through their policy as well. Andrew Honhorst, the city. Andrew, good to catch up. I know you're looking for 75 from the Federal Reserve next week. The problem often, and this is always the case, that you have a market focused on one thing and a policymaker looking at another. The policymaker is saying, look out of 2023. We're going to keep rates up there. We're going to be persistent about this. We don't want to lose them prematurely. The markets are just looking for the downshift from 75 to 50, from 25 to pause. And let's face it, are they going to get a signal of a downshift in this news conference next week? Well, and if they do, what kind of economic pain has to accompany that? There and this is Morgan Stanley's concept, through. which is what could potentially cause, I'm just going to ignore that, cause the Fed <laughs> to move away from raising rates and actually lower them. It would have to be economic pain that they see actually causing a real problem because it's unlikely to see inflation really get down to that 3% level in core that might make them a little more comfortable without that. You got me going. I need my sausage roll now, my second breakfast. John, this parlor game of gaming rates up and then we're also going to game at the same time when we turn around and reduce interest rates. This is a modern insanity. It's increasingly frustrating, Tom, but it's happening. Yes. And ultimately, that's what the Fed is pushing back against. The Fed is and trying to maintain tight financial conditions to bring inflation back towards something that looks like a trajectory back towards target. The problem is every time you get a sniff, just a sniff of some kind of soft landing, financial conditions start to loosen again, yeah, yeah. they don't tighten. Yeah, and this is part of the problem, and this is the reason why we had people coming on and saying it's game theory, right? Didn't Jonathan Gallup say that? that was Credit Suisse? Yep. It was like, you know, it's game theory. You know, the Fed wants us to believe uh, they're going to be hawkish, but they're not uh, actually going to be hawkish. I find it interesting that over in Europe, you've got the ECB still saying they do not see a recession. And everybody I, else is doubling down on it. I mean, BlackRock's Wei Li, uh, who's going to be joining us tomorrow, she actually came out and she, yesterday with a note and said, yeah, there's going to be a recession. The energy costs are going to cause a recession here. It's very, very difficult for a policymaker to forecast a recession and say those words out loud because there's something self-fulfilling about a policymaker saying that. In fact, I think the only one that has done it out of all the major central banks is the one right here. In fact, Tom, the one just around the corner. It's the Bank of England and Governor Bailey. They're the only are ones they that have done Are they just around it. the corner? Just around the I corner. I did not know that. You walk past really? there every morning when you come. Is that the guy that waved at me too. today? Maybe he waved at me just on the way the over corner. today. You think Governor Bailey saw you? I think he waved at me. Yeah, I said, did I see you at Jackson Hole? Did he, did he remind you that the decision is next week, not this week? Yeah, he did. Good. You know, it's after the Fed, which is actually a big deal. Teach you how to chat. <laughs> Futures positive six tenths of one percent. CPI Ten, just around nine. the corner. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> 
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is claiming success for his forces in that counteroffensive. Zelensky says Ukrainian troops have now recaptured more than 2,300 square miles in the east and south of the country this month. But Russian forces have hit Ukraine's energy infrastructure, leaving hundreds of thousands of people in the dark. Inflation in the U.S. probably slowed for a second month in a row. But that's unlikely to prevent the Fed from delivering another jumbo interest rate hike next week. In a Bloomberg survey, economists forecast an 8.1 percent rise in prices last month from a year earlier. The Consumer Price Index comes out at 8.30 New York time. Bloomberg has learned that the Justice Department has subpoenaed dozens of former President Trump's campaign operatives and allies. It's part of an effort to collect information related to the plot to overturn the 2020 presidential election. A lawyer for one of those subpoenaed, former New York Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, calls it a fishing expedition. And the Twitter whistleblower who is warning of security flaws will take his case to Congress today. Peter Zatko's testimony could further complicate the legal battle between Twitter and Elon Musk. Musk is trying to back out of a $44 billion agreement to acquire the social media company. Zatko's testimony comes on the same day that Twitter shareholders are also set to vote on the deal. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're in the camp that inflation is going to decelerate. They're going to raise rates by another 75, most likely, in, in less than two weeks' time pushing the funds rate to three. That's in a six month period of time, 300 basis points off zero. The head of America's fundamental fixed income at BlackRock, making the point that we've done a lot of work in a very short amount of time at this Federal Reserve as they play catch up to bring inflation back down. Equity futures going into the CPI report, they're firmer this morning. They're firmer by six tenths of one percent on the S&P. Yields are lower by four basis points to 317 on a 10 year. The euro stronger, dollar weaker again. 10175 on euro dollar firmer by a half of 1% on that currency pair. Four days of gains on the S&P into Tuesday. Is that the winning streak now, Bramo? Four days of gains, I believe, yeah. is the longest winning streak going back to early July. <clears throat> yeah, and some people saying it reminds people a lot of July because there isn't a lot of liquidity and a lot of, not a lot of conviction and it's not very loved. A 5% rally, Tom, in that short rally. Yeah, I, I think it's a short covering. Yeah, that's what's in the zeitgeist, but it's got to be more than that, John. But is it like June where you go up, you turn around, come right back down, or is there something different this time? And we'll have to. And see get how clipped it goes. around the head, around the ears by this Federal Reserve and Neil yeah. Kashkari. Yeah, well. And the Minneapolis I, I, Fed president I, who decides that perhaps this market shouldn't be running. There, there's a lot of Uber bears that are going, ooh, okay, that was harsh. Right now, let's look at oil. We do this with Regina Mayer, global head of energy at KPMG steeped in all of the game theory of her Rice University. Regina, I want to focus on the game theory right now of President Biden in one chart I just saw in passing, which is our so-called strategic oil reserve. And the proper scientific word for this is the volume we have in reserve has truly cratered. What does that mean for America? Well, I do think we've probably reached a tipping point where it's time to focus on refilling the strategic petroleum reserve because it is at an all time low. Um, and I think we're sort of out of the woods from a U.S. energy price pressure that was driving inflation and the things that I know the politicians were worried about coming into the midterms. And that was the price at the pump. We see gasoline prices in the U.S. consistently go down and down and down. So I believe if anybody was taking my advice, it's time to start focusing on on restocking our SPR and, and getting right. it uh, a little above where it, where it is today. Can you get out the Kufal and Esser slide rules at KPMG and tell me how much a gallon of gas is going to go up as President Biden restocks that reserve? Are we going up 20 cents a gallon, 52 cents a gallon? What's that statistic? No, actually, I think we're out of the woods on gas prices, Tom. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we've done with summer driving season. We've got quite a lot of stock. The refineries are up and running again. I'm less worried about what that would do immediately to gas prices. I will say that what the administration did with regard to releasing 
fuel from the SPR was one of the key things that the energy industry will say made a material difference in the summer peak season than when we set gasoline prices at their peak in June. Regina, that's a story over in the United States. You're in Portugal right now in Lisbon and we're in London and the focus very much is on energy and it's a very different and multi-pronged concern because it's not all uh, gasoline or crude, it's natural gas, it's, uh, it's, it's some of the issues with nuclear energy over in France. From your perspective, is the plan that's coming to shape from the European Union of trying to cap demand while also providing uh, profits from the energy companies to households, does this make sense? Does it feel feasible to you? Well, Lisa, I think that the EU's already made quite a bit of progress. So we have seen European gas prices drop. We're at a seven-week low, um, and it's 40% off its peak on August 26. It's still eight times higher than normal, but there are bright spots. Gas storage is up 84% right now, and it's slightly above where they would have expected to be for the five-year average. The countries have been working on securing as much supply as possible. Now they're looking at packages to reduce demand and to cap what that would do to household income. It's gonna cost a lot of money. There's gotta be, uh, national budgets are gonna be strained. So there's gotta be a lot of different things that, that happen. I would not say they're out of the woods because if it's a particularly cold winter and if we see Asian demand start coming back in where cargoes of LNG are priced up in a competitive way, that's where things get really critical again. So not out of the woods, but the things that they have been doing in the near term are having a, a measurable impact. Okay, so Regina, could you just build that out a little bit, a measurable impact in that we are seeing gas, uh, natural gas prices come down significantly. But is that impact going to lower them further as they are still eight times higher than where they were a year ago? Or is it going to just keep them here, keep it just sort of a persistent crisis rather than something that is much more acute and immediately needing to, to be addressed? Definitely. We're, we're not out of the woods. And I, I think that the pullback in the recent days is probably over amplified with what's happening in Ukraine. I think maybe there's a little bit of a rational exuberance about what happened and maybe some people thinking, okay, the war might be over and we can stop weaponizing gas. I don't anticipate that at all. So while the measures are important and what I see the EU working on is a comprehensive package because you have to work on both demand and supply, no doubt it's having a material impact and it will have a material impact on the economy. I'm hearing from some executives here in Portugal that they're energy costs are in some cases a billion dollars over right what their expected energy costs are all of that's going to have a material impact on earnings competitiveness and they're going to shut down factories because it's too expensive to run them we're already seeing that and we could see a whole lot more going deeper into winter <coughs> regina mayor there of kpmg out of lisbon portugal today lisa that's the problem for the europeans we've gone over it repeatedly you're going to see a wave of industry shutdowns as we go deeper and deeper into winter if they can't tackle this problem and i think it's unrealistic to expect them to be able to tackle this problem completely fully this winter it's whether they can next winter or the one after that so it's not just an issue of curbing demand in the near term and trying to help households it's also an issue of how do you build out the infrastructure where is that natural gas going to come from and Anne marie yesterday was talking about how a lot of it's coming from the United States, yep. which really creates new alliances and new needs at a time when there's questionable leadership in a lot of different places in the world. And new complaints too, yeah. if the US consumer has to carry on playing high prices for exactly. that gas and the Americans are exporting so much. One of the biggest complaints I've heard since we've been here in London and we've spoken to energy experts is the complaint around the lack of an effort to curtail demand in this country. That all we've had so far is a big, big effort, I say all because it's massive from this government, to support people's ability to pay the bills, but doing very little to curtail the demand. Pro-growth, John. It's pro-growth. You just help them spend, and then you also borrow lots of money, and don't worry about budgeting the balance, like balancing the budget. And that's basically been the theme that we've heard, and a lot of people are saying it's different than what's going on in Europe. Sure. It's different than any kind of economic theory. What John, what does Tuesday look like after the funeral for this queen? That's a hard time. How does the debate <laughs> click in Tuesday? I think almost immediately. I agree. We've got to hear from this government and get some yeah. kind of statement on what's well, going to happen fiscally, and then we'll hear from the Bank of England. It's go, go, go. And I would, John, take it down to our team coverage and team reporting here at Bloomberg Surveillance. Our entire team has been looking at the freshly cooked sausages, a pillow soft white <laughs> breakfast roll, plus a generous dollop of HP is this, sauce. Is this, is this a Greg's? Two price rises for the sausage roll 
Hey, Greg's pence, I say. Okay, pence. Do you know how many of them they sell every week? <laughs> to me? <laughs> Two million plus a week. Seriously? Sausage rolls. But my favorite thing is he's looking up Greg's sausage rolls and I'm trying aware. to figure out how to weave it into here. He's trying to find out how to yeah, deliver the them. Yeah, the inflation. Can you deliver, deliver yes. them? Yes. Four, three, <laughs> <laughs> two. <laughs>
even though Tom is not. I'm interested because this highlights I think he what just the demand. <laughs> while she was speaking about I mean, it. It's happened before. It'll happen again. He did grunt, and that is going to be his response to bond oh. auctions. And I will say this is a very interesting moment because the roll off of the Federal Reserve balance sheet is gaining steam. So suddenly, yeah. do you get? more concern on the part of investors about a lack of Fed <clears throat> put or a lack of Fed buying and you know how does that affect their involvement? It's QT and not QE. I think that also has consequences yeah. for the fiscal conversation we're having here in the UK yes. and across Europe for that matter as well. Yeah if you don't have that big buyer of that balance sheet then how do you finance a lot of these fiscal spending programs at the same kind of rates that don't become fee that don't become infeasible and kind of reach those thresholds you were talking about Are earlier? you looking forward to the auctions a little bit later yeah? I'm all over the auction. I, I, I the surveillance that. snap is global, I should point out. We you're going to take the nap we'll around that be, time. Right there. Really Mona Mahajan wrong. joins us now, senior investment strategist at Edward Jones. Mona, uh, let's start here. A conversation about whether this rally we're seeing over the last four days or so is just the bear market rally we witnessed back in the summer. What is the difference? Yeah, you know, I think this rally is perhaps uh, in part driven by the enthusiasm or anticipation of the number we're going to get at 8.30 a.m. today, which is a CPI print that will likely be uh, below last month's. The headline inflation, as we all noted, uh, likely to come down given what we're seeing in gas prices, oil prices, commodity prices broadly. Uh, all eyes will be on that core CPI figure. Uh, we all know that shelter and rent tends to be stickier, but we are getting an offset from lower airline fares, lower uh, car prices to some extent. And so, you know, we're probably poised for a decent number at 8.30 a.m., which, you know, the story really for 2022, the rest of the year, is what direction of travel will inflation go? And the Fed wants to see not just one print lower. They want to see two, three, maybe four prints lower. Uh, mm -hmm. Once we get that and we head towards year end and the Fed can pause potentially uh, and financial conditions mm -hmm. maybe start to ease and go in the right direction of travel, that's when we think we'll get a more sustainable rally. Until then, we do right. think volatility more likely. Uh, Mona, you have a huge advantage with your representation of Edward D. Jones. They are nationwide. They are across the fabric of the nation. How crushed are the clients of Edward Jones by this unimaginable 8, 9 percent inflation? Yeah, look, you know, there are several uh, pockets of this country that are still suffering from elevated inflation. And you th think about uh, the segmentation of our retail clients, but segmentation of the population broadly. Clearly, those on the lower end of the spectrum, those that are living more paycheck to paycheck, are feeling this 8% inflation still uh, to a larger extent. And that comes up in the grocery store bills, that comes up in the, the gas pump. But the good news is it's a very tangible move lower over the last few weeks. Uh, we're seeing it in, in gas prices at the pump. Um, even parts of your grocery store bill are looking a lot better. And so I think uh, a little bit of optimism, and we're seeing that come out in the economic metrics as well when you think about um, inflation expectations not being anchored higher, in fact, moving in the right direction again, lower. Uh, when you look at things that, like the ISM uh, prices paid index for both manufacturing and services rolling over pretty dramatically. When you look at even the supply chain stress indices um, heading downward. So we think the momentum is moving in the right way. Uh, things like a cooling housing market, a potentially cooling labor market, they will take more time to show up in the inflation figures. Uh, but we do hope to see that towards your end as well. So, Mona, are you all in on soft landing? Are you loading the boat on S&P? Is that really the new phrase? <laughs> you know, I think uh, soft landing right now, I think, will still depend on um, this is a still unprecedented Fed cycle here. Keep in mind, the Fed doesn't have a great track record. Eleven of the last 14 Fed cycles ended in recession. Uh, this one, we're going up to a 4 percent terminal rate. We're going in 75 basis point increments. There was a lag impact from such dramatic Fed rate hikes to the real economy. Uh, we do anticipate a slowing uh, economic momentum below trend for sure uh, as we head towards year end. Um, but I think the probability of a full on uh, recession still remains low. If we do enter a downturn, we still don't see the scope for a deep or prolonged recessionary environment here in the U.S. Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones, we've heard that many, many times. Not the soft landing <laughs> part, the short and shallow part. Mona, thank you. It's always great to catch up with you. We appreciate it. Tom, this soft landing, this whole uh, argument, this debate but... got fuel from the payrolls report a number of Fridays ago when the participation rate climbed, unemployment climbed, wages were soft, the payrolls were still robust. That's just one data point and a whole host of data points John... that are speaking to this idea that maybe it can be executed. But I'll say this, and this is the important part. 
This is about the journey back down towards what? Six, five percent on inflation. The journey from five back towards target, which is two, is a very, very different effort. And what this Fed is basically telling you is that to convince us that we're on a trajectory back towards two, and we don't want to prematurely lose it. Too far away. We've got to get rates up and then stay there and wait. And then even if we've got the itch to think we're there, we've got to wait and then wait a little bit longer. The fear right now is that they're going to go back to the 70s. They will move too quickly to loosen up financial conditions, to loosen up financial policy, monetary policy. And then you'll get a resurgence because some of the dynamics haven't been healed. And this really goes to this question of understanding an inflation that is different than the 1970s, but feels much more pervasive and much more global than it has in a long time. This is what Mohamed el Arian wrote about, I believe, in the Financial Times a number of months ago. Go, Tom. The risk of a flip-flopping Fed. Chairman yeah, but Powell, you may not get a flip-flopping Fed. Well, I Chairman take... Powell is telling you, he is telling yeah. you that he wants to avoid that almost at all costs in that address in Jackson Hole right. a few weeks back. I, I take great issue with the idea that American capitalism, American finance, and the people of America can't operate in a higher yield environment. They can. Like the 70s, no. Obviously, that was terrible. But to move up here to some form of neutrality and wait and monitor and see what happens is certainly doable. The one argument against that, and Tom, I'm with you, the one argument against it, Soft and I think this will ending. resonate with Lisa a little bit more than perhaps you, is perhaps. The, the debt load. It's the debt load, Lisa, the increase in the debt load, particularly on the sovereign, not just in America, but worldwide. So the argument against that, and I've been going back and forth with a number of strategists about this. Some people say it is crippling. There is too much debt to really uh, withstand this. Plus, you have a lot of countries that are trying to borrow, right? On the flip side, that debt <clears throat> is with nations. It is not with households. And that is a big difference. And that's where the short and shallow idea comes from. Yeah, yeah, from. exactly. Sure. In the next app, Scott Clements is going to join us from City. In fact, Brown Brothers Harriman, I'll get that right. Uh, he's going to join us from Brown Brothers. He's in, in the next city, hour I'm sure. I am. I'm sure you he's in that. the city in New York. Yeah, there you Thank go. Thank you. Anytime. That was the perfect sec. Thank you. <laughs> Features are positive <laughs> by 7 cents and 1%. You've got to count us down in French, mm -hmm. Tom. Yeah. It's a CPI. Mm. Sausage thread. Mm. 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 He's grunting again. What, what language mm. do they speak in Venezuela as we count down to CPI? That might be more apt. 8% is still a real number. Yeah, it Let's is. be clear about that. Even if it's got a seven handle today, that's a yes. real number too. CPI, just around the corner. From London, we'll be talking to New York. There you go. <laughs> there you hour. go. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukrainian forces have recaptured more than 2,300 square miles in the east and south of the country so far this month. That's according to President Volodymyr Zelensky. He said Ukrainian troops are continuing to push forward. Meanwhile, Ukraine is appealing for more weapons to build on its recent success. Bloomberg's learned that Germany will provide $68 billion in loan guarantees for struggling energy companies. The money will come from a fund set up to help companies cope with the economic hit from the pandemic. Germany is at the center of Europe's energy crisis, and there's concern that there could be a wave of corporate bankruptcies. President Biden is trying to capitalize on a sudden stretch of positive economic news. His goal is to turn the Democrats' biggest political liability into an election year selling point. The Democrats' bid to retain control of both houses have Congress of Congress have been boosted by falling gas prices and signs that inflation may be easing. That latest inflation data comes out at 8.30 New York time. UBS plans to raise a dividend for this year by 10 percent. The Swiss bank also expects share repurchases will exceed a target of $5 billion for 2022. UBS is returning excess capital to investors after calling off the $1.4 billion acquisition of U.S. robo-advisor Wealthfront. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We are in sort of a tipping point. For now, governments in general have been able to uh, mitigate a lot of the raw impact of the rise in gas prices that may become more complicated as we get into 2013, into 2023, sorry. Jules Marc there, the Chief Economist at AXA Investment Managers, as we count you down to the CPI report. 
in about an hour and 12 minutes. We caught up with City's Andrew Hollenhorst only 30 minutes or so ago. He's looking for a 75 basis point rate hike from this Federal Reserve at their meeting next week. Going into that CPI print and that meeting, we've got a rally in this equity market over the previous four days, amounting to about a 5% move on the S&P 500. Right now, futures are by 6 or 7 tenths of 1%. Yield's a bit lower. We're down by 4 <coughs> or 5, negative 5 basis points to 331 on a US 10-year. TK, euro dollar, once again, dollar weakness. Yeah. Euro dollar, 101.82. And I can tell you on sterling, we're looking at a 117 handle through much of this morning. Sterling in, in America this morning as well, with Dow futures up over 200 points. Thanks That's for that, a good sign. That's no, it's useful. See. It's good stuff. VIX 23 is uh, there as well. It'll be interesting to see what the VIX does at 830. Right now, and most importantly, Maria Tadeo is in Brussels and joining us here with a view of St. Paul's Cathedral. Lizzie Burden joins us back from Buckingham Palace as uh, the uh, ceremonies for the Queen move forward. Lizzie, I want to start with you, and it is the topic of the city this morning. And this is a new Chancellor of the Exchequer, and some would say a purge by the new Prime Minister. This is, this is not equivalent in America. You've got a first-class guy out of uh, Trinity, Cambridge, and LSE, Tom Scholar, who has been shown the door after 30 years of civil service to this nation. Let's first start, why was Mr. Scholar shown the door in the trust purge? Yeah, he's gone all the way back to Gordon Brown, Tom Scholar, number one guy at the Treasury. But Truss is making a statement. She says that she's taking on the blob, the orthodoxy at the Treasury and the Bank of England. She wants to get rid of the abacus economics. So as one government oh, economist... What? You want her to define keep what an going. abacus is? Just, just keep <laughs> As one former government economist, economist put it to us, it's a symbolic decapitation. This is showing that there's a new ruler in town. Uh, and, <coughs> but it leaves a huge power vacuum at the top of the Treasury at a time when you've got double-digit inflation. And right. the worry is, yes, you're dismissing Tom Scholar, but what about all the other people in the Treasury who are the most employable in the civil service who will now choose right. to quit of their Let's own accord? Script, your opinion on this? Well, I think what Lizzie's explaining actually started with Boris Johnson on his way out the door. Do you remember that parting speech about the Treasury and their role and the job they've got to do? Feels like he laid the groundwork for them to follow on with Liz Truss and the new Chancellor. But the thing about the Truss Quarteng relationship is that this will be actual alignment, unlike Sunak Johnson. Precisely, yeah. And this is going to be the closest alignment since the Osborne Cameron days. That's what Truss wants. And surely that's a good thing when you're in an economic crisis, right? <laughs> well, we've been talking about it. Depends what you want to do, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it also depends on how much you support your economy and at what cost. And, and, and Maria, today I'd love to get the compare and contrast with the European, the EU plan for energy versus the UK plan for energy, which is to give aid in the UK to households and just borrow to plug the gap. Whereas in the European Union, there is a focus on curbing demand, directly targeting the demand and taking money from the profits of the big oil uh, conglomerates. How much is this gaining steam? When is this going to get passed? What details do we know? Uh, well, we're about to find out because this is happening behind the scenes uh, in a meeting led by Ursula von der Leyen as we speak. But I think uh, you really hit the nail there. It will be about taxation. They want to call it a solidarity contribution from some of this fossil fuel companies, also uh, power generators that do not use uh, gas. And then it's a story about demand destruction. And what they say here is that when supply is tight, but also very expensive, what you need to do is use less power. To me, the thing to watch for here is the percentage. What kind of reduction are they hoping to get? And also the obvious question is, how do you implement it? And it's very clear that police is not going to show to your house to see whether or not you're turning off the heat. And this is a story about the big European buyers, but also the big European companies. So I'm interested to see whether or not they want to play ball here and what is the incentive uh, to get them to, well, participate in this demand destruction. And it's not just at any time of the day. They say they want to see it at peak times because this is when the bill comes up the highest. I'd say it depends how long it goes on for before people start turning up and checking thermostats deeper into the winter, but who knows. Lizzie, the criticism that people have leveled at this government is that this government isn't doing what the Europeans are doing, which is thinking about curtailing demand. They've come out with a massive fiscal intervention in the last week. To complement that, do you expect at some point there to be some kind of policy to curtail demand around energy consumption? 
doesn't look like it what this whole package is is untargeted and not in any way asking people to turn off the lights you know as they are in European cities we've still got all this unnecessary energy consumption and that's the warning that Philip Hammond the ex-chancellor came on and told us about because really it's a blank check the UK's energy bailout Javier Blas had a great column saying that it was you know it's a it's the biggest uh, short on the wholesale gas and electricity markets with yeah. no head uh, because it is a blank check and our documents that Bloomberg seen say that it could cost 200 billion pounds so no that is the major criticism along with the fact that trust has ruled out the windfall tax and it's going to rely so heavily on borrowing and perhaps it's not a one-off given what we're hearing from the Chancellor. Well, that's the other thing, is that it's uncapped, right? They plan to do this in perpetuity. Of course, we've been talking about this for a while, which is at what point do foreign investors say, yeah, we're out? Yields up. Yields Yield, up and away. That's another way weaker. to say yields up and currency weaker. Well, I wonder what this Bank of England governor thinks as well, going into the meeting next week. We've talked a lot, Tom, about the 75 from the ECB, uh, the 75 uh, yeah. we might get from the Federal Reserve next week. You've mentioned it, Tom, the day after. It's the Bank of England's turn and Governor I Bailey. think each nation culturally is different, and the United Kingdom is radically different than the structures of Europe and America. It's a, it's a separate and discreet debate away from Powell, away from Lagarde. Is this just the beginning, though, from this UK government? Elisa, the intervention last week around energy, some people might make the argument that reduces inflation in the short term, may allow the Bank of England to go a little bit more slowly. But if you are to believe what this Chancellor is about to do, along with this Prime Minister, with tax cuts and all the rest of it, then perhaps that's another reason for this Bank of England to go a little bit more quickly. Especially when you add on to that the unemployment figure that we got earlier this morning, which is unemployment rates falling in the UK. It's the lowest since the mid-1970s. Now, this sounds like good news, but it's because people are just leaving okay. yeah. the market. So that's a fewer, a smaller workforce getting higher mm. wages because there aren't enough people to fill the jobs. I wouldn't bring this up, but I happened to wander by Brown's Hotel while I was eating dinner the night, the night of Brexit while John was doing 15 hours in a row on air. True story. But from <laughs> Brown's Hotel, John, we haven't talked about Brexit. Is this a nation affected by Brexit as I, well I'm, as the economic I'm so happy there's only 15 <laughs> seconds left on the seconds. clock and, do and we don't have to talk about Brexit. Lizzie doesn't want to do that either. Lizzie, thank you. And to Maria Tadeo, <laughs> thank you to you as well. We're about an hour away from a CPI report in America with futures up almost seven tenths of one percent from London. This is Bloomberg. The inflation report in America, 60 minutes away. Live from London, good morning to you. Futures are positive by 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. A rally in this equity market continues to build over the last four days higher by around about 5%. Higher again this morning by 7 tenths of 1%. Yields are lower, back in a way by five basis points to let's call it 331 on a 10-year, 330.80 on a 10-year yield. The two-year very, very close to 360 in yesterday's session. We back away from that across the curve. Yields are lower in the FX market once more. This is the theme of the last week for sure. All of that dollar strength still in there over the last year or so, but backing off. Dollar softer, weaker, negative against the euro. Euro dollar positive six tenths of one percent. Tom, that's very close to one hundred two. How do we rationalize a forty-two hundred SPX? I, I mean, we got so many people. Not a million miles away. Yeah, we're not a million miles away. Sure. And I just, I just wonder into Q four. Remember Q two? We we're all gloomed about Q three, and boom. But then we rallied. Than and good. then what happened? The Fed well, pushed we back. back again. So we're going to ease financial we're conditions into the Fed. And we're all going to be asking a question next week to see if Chairman Powell pushes back. And we'll ask a question, something along the lines of saying, is this an unwarranted easing of financial conditions right. relative to what you need to achieve to get inflation back towards target? And I think the backdrop of everybody being all bulled up and then all, all bared up and then all bulled up, or at least more bulled up than they were bared up. You're confusing me now. I know, but the, the positioning is light. There is a lot of volatility. Sure. People yeah. don't love this. And I love how Bank of is America it? wrote that this, you know, how do you trade this rally even if you have no yeah. faith in it? Basically sums up where we are right is now. Is it good news or bad news or bad news, good news that Mark Cabana is with us? Which I is think it's just good news. <laughs> it's just, it's good, just good, good, news. good news. Let's do that right now. We are certain <laughs> it is good news to talk to someone so astute. Mark Cabana is head of U.S. rate strategy at Bank of America and writes brilliant, very terse notes about the moment ahead. Mark, what is the singular sentence of your research note this morning? That the Fed is probably going to overdo it. 
Um, we have seen them turn very hawkish uh, with the labor market strength that we have seen. Uh, that has caused us to revise up our path for the Fed. We now think terminal, top of the range, be 4.25%. And we think that the Fed will try and stick to this higher for longer mantra, but they're going to see a softening in the economic data and the tightening that they're putting in today will risk overdoing it in the future. And that's probably going to result in a recession, an increase in the unemployment rate to around 5%. And even though the Fed doesn't want to contemplate the notion of rate cuts in 2023 or 2024, the tighter they are today, the more likely it is that they're going to have to cut over that period of time. And we're about to get a reasonably constructive CPI print. Our economists are generally in line with the street. We think that we're going to see headline CPI move lower on a month over month basis. Core will be a little bit stickier. This is the type of inflation that the Fed needs to see. It's going to be the start of a trend lower in inflation. And as we're seeing the start of that trend, the Fed is sounding very, very hawkish. So, again, we do see risks that the Fed overdoes it. We do see risks that there's a recession next year. And we do see risks that that's going to be a continued headwind for risk assets and markets more broadly. Mark, Mike Gapen has penciled in that recession for next year. Do you have a decent understanding of where the threshold is for this Fed to pause? Right now, it seems very, very high. And if I had to point to one indicator and one indicator only, I would point to the labor market. It really seems like the Fed wants to see a material softening in the labor market. They're probably somewhat cautiously optimistic behind closed doors that inflation will be moderating. Certainly, most economists anticipate this. Uh, surveys <laughs> of inflation expectations anticipate this. And the market, the tips market, also anticipates this. But the Fed probably won't trust that until they see the labor market soften more meaningfully. And it certainly seems like the Fed is dead set on ensuring that they get that labor market slowdown. And they're going to keep rates as high as it takes in order to get that. Again, that just increases the risks of a hard landing or a recession in the future to us. But I do think that their focus likely right now is somewhat singularly on the labor market. Certainly, that's where we have seen the stronger data over the, the July intermeeting period over really the last month or two. And that's probably what has caused them to shift their tone and sound even more hawkish in relation to the last FOMC meeting. Mark, a lot of people are expecting the CPI print to be constructive, as you said, to be lower, uh, not higher, and to give some sense that there is this disinflationary feel. How much of that is actually due to the tightening in monetary policy? So we think that a lot of it has to do with lower energy prices. Um, and I heard you earlier on this program talking about the very important distinction between um, headline drivers, goods drivers, and services drivers. Um, and so we think that the Fed wants to see just a little bit more of easing on the services side, lower OER, lower inflation in uh, reopening sensitive or travel sensitive sectors in the economy. That's what we think they're going to be looking for. Now, no doubt the tightening of financial conditions that we have seen is playing a part of the broad economic moderation that appears to be underway. But really, if you look since the last FOMC meeting, financial conditions are a bit tighter. Um, but I wouldn't say that uh, it's notable by any stretch. And I do worry that this is a Fed that wants to see even more tightening of financial conditions in order to have faith that they will be able to achieve their 2% inflation target. Certainly, we think that the risks are skewed in the Fed continuing to sound hawkish um, and that continuing to be a headwind for risk assets. Another way to translate this might be they want to see stocks go down a little bit more to give them comfort uh, that perhaps people were buying their message. There is a question of how long it's going to take for the full effect of the tightening to really be borne out in markets, in the economy. And this is something people have been talking about, that by the time they start seeing the effects, it'll be too late to really turn around too quickly. How much will the runoff of the balance sheet quantitative tightening, which is accelerating this week, really turbocharge some of those effects? Yeah, it's a great point. Um, certainly, you're right. We are seeing the Fed tightening really kick into high gear here with broad-based expectations for another 75 basis point rate increase at the September meeting and the increase in the balance sheet runoff up to its maximum amount where caps are $95 billion a month. Now, to date, we don't think that QT has had much of an impact. And we are still somewhat cautiously optimistic that over the next couple of quarters, the QT impact is not really going to be particularly 
heavily felt by the market. And a part mm -hmm. of this reason is because we do think that there's just excess liquidity in the banking system. Banks are still holding a lot of excess unwanted deposits or excess unwanted reserves. And QT does help them get rid of those deposits. So the early stages of QT, we just don't think are going to be that consequential. But by the time we get into right. the first half of next year, maybe Q1 of next year, we do think that you're going to start to see more bank deposit competition, that's going to be driving short-term interest rates modestly mm -hmm. higher, and that's probably going to bite a little bit more. So again, we do think that QT matters. It's just going to probably take a little while before it really right. starts to bite. Mark, I want you to help John Farrell here. He's doing the real yield from LHR here on Friday on the way out. I don't know if it's Terminal <laughs> 5 or Terminal 2, uh, but it'll be a great view of the of a buoyant Heathrow uh, so. airport. Oh, okay. Right now, we've got a nominal yield moving, and the partial <laughs> differentials to the break-evens is stunning. There's an inertial force to the break-evens, which borders on act of God. What does that signal mean of lower break-evens right now to your world? It means policy mistake. Again, the Fed is tightening in anticipation that inflation will remain persistent, and they feel like they really need to be aggressive in order to bring it down. But it strikes us that certainly the tips market is not reflecting elevated expectation of runaway inflation. If anything, the tips market continues to believe that the Fed is credible in its fight on inflation. And it's not just the tips market. It's also inflation expectation surveys. We saw that clearly in the New York Fed surveys, three year ahead expectation yesterday. Inflation expectations are declining as the Fed ramps up their hawkishness. So what that is doing in the rates market is it's causing real rates to rise. And it's really that real rate rise that matters more for the broad set of financial conditions. Look, if interest rates are rising just because inflation is elevated, that should have a fairly limited impact on broader financial mm -hmm. markets. But if real rates are rising, that has a much more meaningful impact. It packs a heavier tightening punch into markets more broadly. And that is what we are seeing. And the higher real rates rise, then the greater the potential is that the economy starts to show signs of moderating and that financial conditions will continue to be tight or that financial conditions will continue to be challenged. And again, it seems like that's what the Fed is going after. We do worry yeah. to some extent that the Fed is going to go too far too fast. And we think that the two tens curve is going to become more inverted as a result of this. And again, we do think that the more tightening they do today, the greater the risk that they will have to cut tomorrow. And again, it is somewhat ironic in this higher for longer mantra that the Fed has been <clears> pushing for. But again, this aggressiveness today really increases the odds in our view that the Fed will be cutting in late 23 or in 2024. Mark, real yields higher then. When you speak to the rest of the team, have you been surprised by, say, on the equity side with Savita, that this hasn't led to lower equity markets in a material way? In fact, they're rallying again, and it hasn't led to, to wider spreads. Yes, we have been somewhat surprised by that. Now, look, a part of this may be due to positioning. A part of this may be due to an expectation that inflation will moderate and that that will allow for the Fed to pivot a little bit sooner, kind of you know, very similar to what we saw in the early summer and some of that, rate, uh, that equity market yeah. rally um, and credit spread performance. And again, if financial conditions continue to remain around these levels, um, then it just r makes a risk that the Fed needs to feel like they have to <laughs> tighten by more and front load it in order to try and get yep. that sustained tightening of conditions in order to slow the economy and to bring down inflation. Hey, Mark, fantastic. Just a bit of a clinic there as well. We appreciate it. Mark Abana there of Bank of America Global Research. Lisa, that's the tug of war between the equity market bulls and what this Fed wants to see. That basically, the more that equity markets shrug off the Fed, the more the Fed's going to tighten the, lean the screws. Yeah, sure. exactly. And that's basically at least what they're doing in the rhetoric, maybe perhaps in the action too. You love this. Thank you, Tom. Oh, it was great. I thought Cabana was great. At 8.30 at here in 45 minutes, I'm looking at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which the last couple of days has pushed against where Chairman Powell it's wants to go. Okay. Jay Bryson, Chief Economist at Wells okay Fargo, is going to be joining us. As Lisa said, look at the S&P. Yeah, I look at the There's Dow. a man called Neil doing that, isn't yeah, it? There it is. I think he is. Yeah. Dow's up 200 points. <laughs> Features on the S&P. Neil Kishkari for this. Up seven tenths of one percent. Not necessarily who I meant. Maybe I've got a buddy called Neil. Equity's up. I don't. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is claiming success for his forces in that counteroffensive. Zelensky says Ukrainian troops have now recaptured more than 2,300 square miles in the east and south of the country this month. But Russian forces have hit Ukraine's energy infrastructure, leaving hundreds of thousands of people in the dark. Inflation in the U.S. probably slowed for a second month in a row, but that's unlikely to prevent the Fed from delivering another jumbo interest rate hike next week. In a Bloomberg survey, economists forecast an 8.1 percent rise in prices last month from a year earlier. The Consumer Price Index comes out at 8.30 New York time. Bloomberg has learned that the Justice Department has subpoenaed dozens of former President Trump's campaign operatives and allies. It's part of an effort to collect information related to the plot to overturn the 2020 presidential election. A lawyer for one of those subpoenaed, former New York Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, calls it a fishing expedition. Bloomberg has also learned that Bayer has quickly started the search for a successor to CEO Werner Baumann. Now that raises the prospect that Bauman could leave before his contract expires in 2024. He has survived plenty of shareholder frustration and legal turmoil since becoming CEO in May 2016. Bauman spearheaded the costly acquisition of Monsanto, which has been a huge legal headache. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. There is a lot of momentum still in the core. I think that this one reading is not going to be enough to dissuade the Fed from a large movement at its next meeting, even if it is a bit softer. Team 75, Stephanie Aronson there, Director of Economic Studies at Brookings Institution. She wasn't specific about being Team 75. Adrian Hollenhorst of City was, though. He joined us in the last hour. Going into that CPI report just around the corner, 8.30 Eastern time, which isn't too far away, Tom. Futures are positive by 7 tenths of 1%. 75 basis points, that's a good statement on a buoyant and strong America, right? If it remains buoyant. And strong. Thank you. As you know, and we've discussed it a million times, if unemployment starts going the other way a little bit more persistently, mm -hmm. then I imagine the balance starts to change. We're going to uh, change our uh, dialogue here right now. This has been a day where we've moved away from the ceremonies for the death of the Queen of England, but we do so with King Charles III in Ireland. The distance from Belfast in Northern Ireland to Dublin is 103 miles, but across the centuries it is substantial. Giving us perspective today, on the watch in Paris, and of course his Ireland is Stephen Carroll, who joins us uh, from Bloomberg News to discuss the moment for King Charles III. What did Brexit do to King Charles' Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, to the island of Ireland, Brexit changed the relationship across these islands, some would argue irreparably. It had been a reasonably stable, reasonably positive relationship, particularly since the visit of Queen Elizabeth in 2011, which for many was a high point of Anglo-Irish relations. It's hard to imagine that a, a monarch would have gotten up in Dublin Castle and opened her speech in Irish with four words, Uthran agus Akorja, president and friends, uh, in a language which many had seen that, of course, historically, the English didn't favour uh, in their, their relations with Ireland. Ireland. Brexit changed the game because you now have uh, very different trade relations with the way that Northern Ireland mm -hmm. functions. They're a special place within the post-Brexit relationship with the European Union. They're still in the European Union's single market. Uh, trading rules with the UK still a complex issue and something that we know that Liz Truss as Prime Minister right. has focused on as well. And it is a question now, the question of Irish unity is back on the table since Brexit in a way that we hadn't seen before because the relationships have been cemented right. on the island of Ireland. This is a matter that is left to a referendum, a referendum that's right. the discretion of the British government here in London to grant to Northern Ireland. But it's a question being asked more now than it ever would have thought of been before you the referendum. You studied with the great Italian at the University of Chicago, Luigi Zingales, who's wonderful on American capitalism. How do you define Irish capitalism? Well, Ireland has a very close relationship with America. If you think of all the tech companies that are in Dublin, it's the European headquarters. For are they there Google just because of a tax dodge? I mean, if you ask them, they say no. <laughs> they, you know, the Irish government's argument has always been that they were transparent about their low corporate tax regime, 12.5%, and they, they Where the did they go with the Yellen? EU. 
Did that like drift away? The minimum tax story. The minimum it's tax story. It's still on, it's still underway. It's a debate that they're hoping to reignite at a European level now because it does seem to have gone off the radar. They've been trying to package it into some of the major legislation in the US as well. It's still an effort led by the OECD in Paris that they're trying to uh, create the structure for this. We know that France has been pushing very hard for it and it was a really big step for them to get countries like Ireland on board with the idea of a minimum corporate tax and with Pascal Dunne, who is head of the Eurogroup, the group of finance, Eurozone finance ministers as well. That's something they had agreed on the principle of both the profit shifting element and the minimum taxation element, uh, but something that still there isn't political agreement everywhere about. And the whole argument of the OECD is you need a global deal for it to be effective of course. so that one country can't try to outbid the others. The focus of this king today is on Northern Ireland. Can you talk to us about the popularity of the monarchy in Northern Ireland? I mean, it's, it's probably the one place in the United Kingdom where the monarchy isn't necessarily going to be universally welcomed, although relations have improved significantly over the years. I spoke about the Queen's visit there in 2011. Yep. This is Charles's 40th visit to Northern Ireland, of course, only his first as monarch. And it's interesting because it is the first time that there is a Sinn Féin, so somebody from the Republican tradition, uh, who is... First Minister Desigat, there is no active government in Northern Ireland at the moment for their own political uh, difficulties, but the idea of having somebody from Sinn Féin who stood up in the Northern Ireland Assembly last week and paid tribute to Queen Elizabeth as the courageous and gracious leader. Now, the Sinn Féin didn't attend the accession uh, event that was held in Northern Ireland. They said that was people who were loyal to the British monarch, but Michelle O'Neill, the First Minister Desigat, is meeting. Prince Charles and the Queen Consort today in Northern Ireland and that's something that represents the relations that are changed over the years. And the troubles with respect to the lack of government in the, in the region and the question around unity has been a theme for us throughout the past couple of days. Can this monarch be a uniting feature at a time when there is that kind of skepticism or do you think that there will be this feeling, this desire for some sort of continuity enough to give people a little bit different of a perspective? I'm not sure that the, really the, the Queen as a uniting figure ever held that much sway in Northern Ireland, although the efforts that had been made in recent years with the number of visits being made uh, by the Queen to Northern Ireland had sown the seeds for a, a positive relationship there. It is going to be a challenge for Charles in the same way that <coughs> uniting relations with Scotland is a challenge as well. Uh, it's, it's, he, d he is somebody that has a relationship with the place and I think that's something that will stand him in good stead, but this is a political matter that's really outside the realm of the monarchy as well. Stephen Carroll, fantastic to see you. In person as well. Thanks for being with us. Thanks we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Tom, another phase in the sequence going forward to next Monday. Well, to next Monday in the funeral service, Mr. Biden will attend. But I, I would prepare, John, besides the hundreds of thousands uh, scheduled to uh, walk by the Queen's casket, I would prepare for something equivalent to what we saw in 1963 in the United States. This should be an extraordinary turnout of world leaders. Overwhelming. Overwhelmingly so. Yeah. Lisa, you and I went through Westminster and onto the palace over the weekend. Can you imagine how much busier it's going to be on Monday? Because London right now, it is packed. It is packed, and they have uh, brought in, I think, 10,000 police officers to London and a number of uh, troops as well to try to have crowd control. And I love the article in the Wall Street Journal about the uh, the Royal Guard saying, please stop leaving Paddington Bears at the Buck oh, yeah. at Buckingham Palace because they're not compostable and people continuing That's problematic. to Paddington Bears. I, I, would, I would say rather selfishly, the football is getting cancelled. A lot of these games are being cancelled <laughs> like, because about. of the police resources. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned the resources. Tom, a lot of these football matches can't go ahead because it takes away so much, the public so much of the police that, resources. Right? I mean, they understand. I think that. some they people would like up. to see these games go ahead so that some of the fans could pay tribute to the Queen because some sporting events have. Continued. But they will start in next Tuesday. Of course, you know, they'll be delayed. Will, you know, then we'll have to squeeze in a lot of the games next going into the Tuesday. World Cup, but you know. And yeah. we'll there are more important things. I'm, I'm not here complaining so about it. So we won't Don't be worry. able to go to said games, which might also factor into your Said yes. games. Did I say anything about that? Absolutely Didn't not. Didn't say anything about that. I'm just putting words CPI, in mouth. so important. <laughs> it's just around the corner. It's 35 Am I wrong? minutes away. Perhaps not. <laughs> Inflation. 8%, whether it's 7.9, yeah. 7.8, well, this is still a big number. As we heard from our cabana talking uh, the Bank of America line, this is about parsing away from the financialization, parsing services and goods inflation. And to see services inflation come in a little, as Mr. Cabana yeah. mentioned, would be a huge deal. The word I think of the moment is persistence, and that is a story for the energy story. That is a word we can use for the Federal Reserve as well and inflation. How much of this will persist? And that's why we need to discuss shelter at 8.30 Eastern. And not only shelter, but also employment. When you take a look at the restructuring of the labor market, how much of that's going to be sticky with people demanding higher wages and not coming back to the workforce as quickly? Where does Scott Clemens work?
Brown, Brown Brothers, Brothers Harriman. Not which, city. But it's Melbourne. in a city. city. But it's Thank in you. a city. It's in New, it's in New York. York city. Fantastic. Anytime. You know, just trying to get it right, just to make sure. <laughs> Scott Clemens really is coming up from Brown it. Brothers Harriman. He's going to join us very, very shortly. We are 35 minutes away from inflation in America, looking for something in and around 8%. The focus of this market will be on core, month on month. We'll go to that in just a moment. This is Bloomberg. In the last two weeks, we've really seen an influx of risk on behavior. It's possible that uh, global inflation continues to push higher. We're in the camp that inflation is going to decelerate. Growth is going to decelerate. The Fed is going to need to see a real slowdown in the labor market. In a way, we are uh, uh, um, just changing the timing of, of the pain. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from London for our audience worldwide. I believe it's good afternoon. Good afternoon now in London at least. Good morning to your stateside on Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Counting you down to a CPI report about 30 minutes away with futures positive 29 on the S&P up 7 tenths of 1% TK. We build on this rally of the last few days. Well, the rally is anticipating uh, inflation that is quiescent. The magnitude is the word here. What kind of magnitude do we get in the headline data, the core data? But John, I would go beneath the headline data. I will go right away to the David Rosenberg world of goods and services. That dynamic is critical. The media, as we often do, may well go with the headline year over year figure, Lisa. That's often the bigger figure. That's why they go with that number. The market will Street, to Tom's point, very focused on month over month core inflation, just to get an idea about the more recent trend. I think you can go even further than that. It's not just going to be the headline core number. They're going to be looking at housing. They're going to be looking at wages. They're going to be looking at, to Tom's point, services. They're going to be looking at the granularity of each component and the stickiness in different sectors, because that's going to possibly be more interesting than even the headline either number. And when they take in the totality of the data, because that's the word they've been using going into the Fed decision next week, is it going to be 50 or 75? I'm only doing this to wind up Tom. Okay. 50 or 75? And I'm going to wind him up even further as he sits there and he starts grunting. It's 75. I mean, pretty much everyone is saying that. Fed officials came out, they said, it's 75. I mean, if they came out and did 50, that would be viewed as incredibly dovish, even though it's a massive hike from any historical perspective. And that's what the market is focused on, Tom. Some participants, anyway, the potential for a downshift from 75 to 50 to 25 and then to the pause uh, through next year. I'm going to move on. Let's say it's 75, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go to November. No, I'm going to move to November <laughs> yeah. and into 2023 of the guesstimate of where neutrality is. I'm going to editorialize. We have no clue. What did Mark Abana say of Bank of America on the guesstimate of next year? Mike Gapen over at Bank of America is now saying recession for yeah. next year. Mark Cabana is talking up rate cuts, but rate cuts after the fact, because he thinks the risk now is the Fed takes it too far. He's talking about unemployment having to rise. And this is sort of the conundrum, because if you get rate cuts, it's because there has been pain that you haven't necessarily seen priced in. This is the Mike Wilson view over at Morgan Stanley. Here come the earnings revisions downward, that that's yep. going to be what drives the next leg lower in the S&P because of exactly that. Can I, can that. I state it could be revenue revisions lower? Because if you do get a vector of inflation lower, all of a sudden a normal 4% grower that's up 7% grower becomes 5.6% and that's that marginal move in revenues. The only counter argument to that, and I don't mean to just cause trouble, but you is are. that By you're going to see, <laughs> you're yeah. gonna see margin compression. If you start to see wages continue to go up, basically consumers pushing back on those prices, demand destruction because of the inflation I, which we've seen. In I'm not that's focused this thing. morning. Mrs. Keene's visiting with me and do you know she's over at the Tower of London what picking out a room for me? What, what is she doing? Are you she in trouble? She's out a room for me. Are you in trouble? I think I'm in it trouble. Sounds like, the Tower it London. sounds like you're in trouble. Let's check out the prices. Let's do that. You. Where's the Dow? The CPI report. No idea where the Dow is. Can I tell you where the S&P 500 is, though? <laughs> Thank higher. you. I imagine the Dow is, too. We're up 28 on the S&P. We're it's higher by 7 cents and 1%. Good move. Good move. to the Dow. It was almost. I mean, that's as far as I'll take it. You mentioned Mike Wilson. That means I've got to mention JP Morgan and Mark Klanovic. Please. Him and the team are basically saying, we can achieve this soft landing. It's much more about the data than it is about the <clears> hawkish central bank rhetoric. What do you make of that? 
Really? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so Marco Kalanovic, you can laugh because he's the perpetual bull. I can laugh, but at the same time, you could argue that I'm perpetually bearish in my outlook. So, you know, it takes one to know one. And you, you got, you're you missing that. Well, I mean, it's not that I'm bearish. It's just that, you know, it's sort of... You're realistic. I'm realistic. Of and, and a little bit of, you know, skepticism of the common party line. Which a healthy is just dose. Sort of a, a, a nature. healthy dose as well. Okay, not about me. Moving on. The point is, really, though, about a soft landing, it's not just him. A lot of people are saying sure. that it's looking more likely because of this deceleration in inflation, as long as you keep it going past Precisely. that 4% level. It's never about whether things are good or bad for markets. It's about whether they are better or worse. And based on the incoming data over the last month or so, I think we can make the argument they're getting better and not worse. Right. And it is multifaceted. It is airplane tickets. It's also uh, some of the surge that we saw in cars coming off. Now the question is services. Now the question is some of these other components. I think the big question socially linking into all this mumbo jumbo you two are spinning <laughs> is OER. Thank you, Tom. I love you, Tom. Is Thank OER. You, Tom. Is real estate, real estate, real estate. It's a huge part of our monthly budget. I love that you yeah. called what we're talking about. My I don't agree with that. With an I just, I, I'm with Kalanovich and that corporations so will adapt. Shelter. The nation yeah. will his adapt. Wife is I'm with Bullard. I'm, I'm aware. Bullard's front loading this. Yeah. Bullard is front loading it to get out front of whatever comes our way. And this is an America that will adapt to these shocks. I can tell you, Scott Clemens has things to say. He's going to join us now, the chief investment strategist at Brown Brothers. Harriman. Scott, what are you looking for, sir, in 25 minutes? <laughs> I, I think we're going to get further evidence that inflation actually peaked in June. And I think I think it was Lisa who put her finger on it right at the top of the hour. That what, what's really important is the ingredients of the report, more so than the headline. Are we continuing to see relief, particularly on the goods and services front, in addition <clears throat> What we're anticipating is more relief in food and energy, and we're seeing that in the underlying commodities market. Probably more important than any of the numbers will be the narrative the Fed wraps around it, because that'll provide some insight into whether or not the Fed is contemplating, uh, dare I use the word, tapering in November mm -hmm. and December to step back to a 50 basis point, 25 basis point hike with a view towards being done with this tightening cycle by early right. 2020. So all the English majors are going to parse the Fed's commentary next week, probably more so than the econ majors look at the numbers on the top line. Scott, I know Brown Brothers Harriman took a meeting at the Langthorne Hotel in Regency, England, and it was the same debate in the 1830s as it is now. You can't pick the bottom. But when you do go up, you always have too much cash. Are we overburdened with cash right now as we invest for 2025? Well, our clients are pretty fully invested in uh, cash, although, although I will recognize that, that investors in general are very long cash. For longer term investors, I would consider that a contrarian indicator doesn't work on a day-to-day -day basis, but in terms of unspent fuel or dry powder or assets on the sideline, characterize it however you want. I think that is fuel for the markets as and when the narrative begins to improve. And if we actually get some increasing relief on inflation, and if we get increasing confidence that the Fed is closer to the end of this tightening cycle than the beginning, there is plenty of cash out there to put behind that improving sentiment. So are you bullish? Lisa, I would say we are, but you have to take that into the context of a longer term view. That's not a statement about September returns or even, you know, between now and the end of the year. But we're looking around at a lot of opportunities in equities that have been unfairly pushed down with the rest of the market, particularly in the first half of this year when it was sort of a risk off sell everything that's not bolted down. So I, I hesitate to use the old cliche, but I'm going to use it anyway. I do believe that we're in a stock picker's market and there are plenty of opportunities for people building portfolios for the long run. That's an investing comment. That's not a trading comment. Can you tell us what stocks you're picking, Scott? <laughs> we keep those a firm secret, Jonathan, although I, I will say that we're finding a lot more opportunities in the mid cap and small cap domestic space. Uh, I'm going to wait, do that economist thing and wave my hands and say, in general, those smaller companies are more geared towards domestic economic activity. We have more confidence in domestic economic activity than outside the United States. And they are less exposed to the strength of the dollar, which I think will be one of the big stories as third quarter earnings reports begin to come out. Scott, wonderful to hear from you. Scott Clemens there of Brown Brothers Harriman. That final point yeah. on small caps. 
is an important one. What are the two things you want to avoid internationally right now? Until more recently, one's the strength of the dollar, that right. translation effect, back from a foreign currency, back into the US. And the other is just the weakness associated that with the revenue generation abroad anyway, given yeah. the difficulties in China, the difficulties in Europe. Yeah, and add to that, Lori Calvacina has been out front on this from RBC Capital Markets saying uh, that these have been the stocks most beaten up and they are the first to start recovering even in a recession, but before the next cycle. So that's the other reason why some people are saying small caps. Always the way, isn't it? Stock pickers market, then you ask for stock picks and you don't Can't talk about it. get any. It's always about active management, Tom. Have you uh, noticed it's, that? Uh, ben Laylor, it's about in the last active month, management. John, Ben Laylor <laughs> yeah. with a brilliant summation of the failure of active management. It is stunning, the math. Well, the more you hear about it, it though, Tom, based on the moment we're in, the argument is this is the moment and maybe things have changed. Okay. If you believe, let's just say, let's just take the mechanics of the index based on the large weighting on the S&P 500 to growth well, next big I, tech. I, and if you believe that real yields are going to be a persistent feature of this regime right. into next year, some people will struggle to make yeah, the John, argument that the index is, is where you want to be. This right? is important. If you're running an index fund and you're working it off the Dow, there's some interesting peculiarities there. Okay. Well, so Tom is trying to tweak you, just to translate I, to everyone, because, because, tweak, uh, because, because, John, you are trying to tweak Tom because you know that this is his third rail as active management and the whole question of that. I do think that to your point, factor investing has been catching on. Yes. Just the, the sort of We've heard that. both of you, right? Because there is are this question. Are you making sure we're getting along? I'm just trying to play the, you know, conciliatory part. You guys are on the same page. The yeah, we're codependent. You know, something like that. Uh, passively, why am I even passively allocated to the Dow? <laughs> no, uh, how, okay, much, how much okay, money is I'm passively not allocated on the Dow to, thing? I don't to think a that Dow, Dow ETF? I don't adhere to the Dow situation. Coming up. How are you doing? I'm great. <laughs> John and I are just, you know, for those of you on radio, John and I are just sitting on the other side of St. Paul's Cathedral. That's all there is to it. It's just positive. Seven tenths of one percent. We're going to talk about OPEC's latest report with Christian Malik of JP Morgan mm. very shortly. CPI is 20 minutes away. <laughs> Thank God for that. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs>《ワールドリポート》ニュースを紹介します。ポッドキャストを聴きました。Ukrainian forces have recaptured more than 2,300 square miles in the east and south of the country so far this month. That's according to President Volodymyr Zelensky. He said Ukrainian troops are continuing to push forward. Meanwhile, Ukraine is appealing for more weapons to be built on its recent success. Deloitte is forecasting that U.S. retailers will see slower sales growth this holiday season because of inflation. The consulting firm expected a 4 to 6 percent increase in holiday sales. Higher prices are expected to drive more consumers online to search for deals. A Chinese made single aisle passenger jet designed to rival Boeing and Airbus could be certified by the nation's regulators this month. That's according to local media. Certification would clear the way for the C919 to start commercial flights some 14 years after development began. And UBS plans to raise a dividend for this year by 10%. The Swiss bank also expects share repurchases will exceed a target of $5 billion for 2022. UBS is returning SX Capital to investors after calling off the $1.4 billion acquisition of U.S. robo advisor Wealthfront. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Shifted its viewpoint from inflation can't just be better than expected, inflation has to be on an absolute basis lower. And we think that Chair Powell and others have had a chance to reset expectations away from 2%, but they really held firm. <clears throat> Karma show this afternoon. I can't decide if people are exhausted or happier. Lisa? Happier, sure. Eric Friedman, the Chief Investment Officer at US Bank Asset Management. I'm not going to let you answer that, just in case. 
Equity Evidently. futures, positive 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500 with CPI just around the corner, 12 minutes away. Yields are coming down, lower negative 6 basis points on a 10 year, just a break of 3.30, 3.29.85. And once again, what you're witnessing this morning is what you've seen over the last few days, which is some dollar weakness. Dollar index down a half of 1%, weaker dollar. Euro dollar positive a half of 1%. 101.72, I think cable Tom, in and around 117. Crude positive 1.6%, getting Mark, closer and closer back to 90. Markets churning here, and again, as John mentioned earlier, I believe it was John mentioned, the monthly inflation data will be of great interest here uh, in a good 11 minutes as well. This is not only our conversation of the day, but our conversation of the week on oil. If you have a fear of $150 a barrel, it has been outlined in a blistering 100-page memo by Christian Malik global head of energy strategy at J.P. Morgan Securities, oh, a good six months ago. Yes, the price is cut away from those fears, but the underlying fundamentals exist. Christian Malik, the, the decrease in hydrocarbons that we've seen, is it just simply an Asia and a COVID flat on their back? Absolutely. In some ways, it's a sort of a, there's a sort of two-pronged story here. You have, on one hand, a slowdown through lockdowns, and some bumpiness in terms of the trajectory on demand, the sort of post-COVID uh, sort of renormalization. But on the other hand, what you're seeing is a lot of volatility and uncertainty continue to exacerbate the supply outlook, meaning that most companies that ought to be investing um, in future production, particularly the majors, are not. So essentially, we're kicking the can down the road in terms of a tightening of the fundamentals. In the meantime, potentially just, in, just enjoying, probably the, not the best word, but ultimately taking advantage of some of the slowdown that we've seen vis-a-vis -vis China and some of the impacts of inflation. Christian, when we spoke with you last time, we spoke about your report talking about the inability for a lot of oil producers to actually produce enough oil and that people right. really had not counted in that potential shortfall. We're just getting some headlines from OPEC with Saudi Arabia telling the nations that produce oil that they increased production by more than 11 million barrels per day, basically showing their ability, their capacity to increase output. Does that give you any confidence? Have you seen anything to change your view on that front? Um, absolutely not. In fact, it's probably consolidated our view because what you have is effectively Saudi uh, as, and, and some members, other members of the GCC essentially subsidizing through av adding barrels into the market, the oil price, but ultimately that is a limited amount of reserve, right? So we, we're literally they're keeping their powder dry through the spare capacity. We do believe Saudi can go north of 12, 12.2 million barrels. But the reality is that we can't just rely on OPEC and Saudi to provide the marginal barrel. Because what you then have is US shales slowing down, rig counts are falling because of logistics, supply chain issues. It's amazing pre and post COVID. It's like you've dismantled it. A few things have gone rusty, you put it back together again, and it's just not as effective in terms of supply growth from shale. And then you're left with um, everybody else, so non-GCC, non-US, which is the majors, the IOCs, and they're doing everything but investing in oil. And that's particularly because of all the uncertainty, not just about the front-end volatility of the price, but social tax, windfall tax, giving cash back. So oil capex has never been as far back in the queue. So that leaves more reliance on Saudi to ultimately fill the gap. But the message, I think, around the future is that it can't be just OPEC that underwrite or fill in the deficits when needed. Um, and this is part of our super cycle thesis that in the end, we're going to see a structural deficit that can't be managed or, or met quickly enough through short cycle barrels. So does anything make you question your super cycle thesis at a time when you've got Morgan Stanley and you have UBS moving away from some of their previous forecasts and actually cutting their near term mm -hmm. outlook for crude prices? Are you doing the same or are you doubling down and saying they're missing the boat? Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're probably in the latter camp of doubling, tripling, quadrupling. I mean, we've been bullish uh, for two years now and we've just all we've seen is this sort of gyration, uh, particularly uh, led by uncertainties around demand. Um, I think there is a degree of sort of uh, 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 confusion as to where demand will ultimately emerge or, or trend to over the medium term. We still believe that demand will ultimately uh, continue to grow to 100, 700 million barrels by 2030. And the issue is this, if that's right, and we have a shortage of all fuels, and we're back to the same issue, which is where, how do we fund, how do we meet this energy deficit in the future? It can't be coal, it can't be gas. Uh, we're maxed down LNG. It's got to be through solar and wind. And then when you've gone through that, 
we still have a major deficit um, in oil, which basically means that we're going to see repricing of oil uh, significantly higher. And so we still stand by our upside right. case in 150. Christian, a, a question that speaks of the moment. I've got like eight ways to go here, but I think we have to speak of the continent of Europe and the hope of prayer of finding energy in the right. next 12 months, the next six months, maybe even the next six years. Maybe it's away from your remit, but do you have an optimism Europe can succeed in staying warm this winter? I think ultimately we're we're okay for this winter, and that's because we've had Nord Stream on. We've had we have gas gas storage up at ninety percent, uh, regas capacity is roughly eighty five percent. So we've got the flex, Tom. The issue is not this winter; it's into next winter, and then we start to debate. Well, how do we actually structurally fix this this long term supply issue of energy? We can't just provide quick fixes and kick the can down the road. So if anything, I'm more concerned about as we go into the second half of 2023, how we manage, uh, particularly as China comes back, I think in some ways, China has appeased uh, this deficit, this crisis in Europe by virtue of having lockdowns. If you have lockdowns um, ease, China reemerges as a marginal buyer of LNG, um, then we will have deficits in Europe in energy that can't wholly be met. Um, through through gas, unless we have gas to oil switching, which is clearly bullish demand for oil, um, particularly through next year, which is why we struggle to take numbers down on demand when all we can see is more uh, more demand for for oil, particularly as it's still the cheapest fuel relative to all other. Christian, that was just brilliant, just to hear you break that down. The bullish thesis there with Christian Malik there of J.P. Morgan Securities. Are we going to have to face another winter? of this. That's basically the argument he's laying out for all of us. And Tom, you've raised this a million times in credit to you. Can you imagine the energy crunch in the world if we didn't have COVID zero? Yes, in China? absolutely. Can you imagine how much read, this might be? I, you know, I rarely sell a sell side report, but I've read everywhere that literally sits on my coffee table uh, at home in the walk up. And the basic idea is it's a 100 page JP Morgan essay. Whether you agree or disagree with it, it's a global essay and it's global dynamics away from the soap opera of America, the soap opera of Europe. Well, we get to the reality, the reality of CPI in just a moment, five minutes away, the CPI report, just around the oh, corner. Oh, we have CPI today. I thought you were yeah. counting us down. Okay. This is a legit four and a half minutes away now, Tom. Four and a half, 4.30. Sure, thanks for that. 4.29. Future's positive, seven tenths of 1% <laughs> on the S&P. Yields down six basis points, 3.29.47 on a 10 year. In the FX market, a weaker dollar, stronger euro, euro dollar 101, 69. <laughs> it's a casual countdown. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>The CPI report in America just seconds away. Going into it, equity futures positive three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are lower by six or seven basis points on a 10-year. The dollar is weaker, the euro stronger, euro dollar 101.68. Waiting for that CPI report to come out. Standing by is Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. It is coming out. It's a little bit higher than wow. anticipated. A tenth of a percent rise for the month of August in the headline number, which is uh, more than the flat reading that we had last month and less than the uh, 0.1 negative reading that was expected. Pushes the year-over-year -year rate to 8.3 percent. The forecast had been for 8.1 percent, so we're a little bit higher. We'll check into the details and see why that is. The core, which matters more to a lot of people, rises six-tenths of a percent. That is double last month and double what's expected. Pushes the year-over-year -year rate to 6.3% from 5.9% last month. The expectation was for a 6.1% move. So some uh, bad news on inflation here. Uh, but it, does it really matter? Because everybody was kind of expecting the Fed to go 75 anyway. Quick look at uh, what some of the increases come from. Food is up 8 tenths of a percent. Food at home, your grocery wow. store, up Seven tenth and energy. This is the one that was supposed to be the big wild card. Gasoline down 10.6 percent. It was up uh, 44 percent on the year last month. Now it's only up 25.6 percent on the year. New cars are up by eight tenths of a percent. That is probably one of the disappointments in this number. Used cars fall a tenth of a percent. There was a forecast that they would be down as much as one percent in this index, and so that is another disappointment. While 
while prices fall, they do not fall as much as the wholesale price index had suggested. And then uh, shelter, uh, the um, the rent component that everybody's been concerned about that keeps rising, keeps rising even faster, up seven tenths of a percent after a half a percent move last month. And on a year over year basis, shelter costs up six point two percent. So uh, we are a long way from saying that inflation is uh, conquered and uh, has peaked. And so the Fed has still more work to do, obviously cements a 75 basis point move. Mike McKay, doubling down on that, going into next week. Mike McKay, thank you. 75, and some might argue, it changes the tone of that news conference with the Fed chair as well. Lisa, we're looking at equity markets lower by more than one full percentage point. We were firm, and now we're negative by 1.35% on the S&P 500. Yields are higher on a 10-year, back through 340. Yeah. That's going to bring back the conversation about whether we have actually seen the high for the year on the 10-year. But the work we're doing at the front end of the yield curve right now Bang, slicing through 360, yields much, much higher at the front end of the curve. This raises a question, not for this meeting coming up next week, but the meeting after and the meeting after. So to your point from earlier, do we go down to 50? Do we go back down to 25? Or do they stay at 75 basis points? I mean, this really changes the discussion at a time when a lot of Fed officials are saying they want to keep rates probably close to 4% for a while. We haven't really factored that in yet. If you wanted to see a persistent and convincing string of economic data, Tom, inflation prints to back off rate hikes, then we just got disruption. That's a disrupting well. data point for this Federal Reserve to see month over month core pick up in the way it did again, Tom. Two, it's going to change the conversation next yeah, week. Two scope and scale here. The real yield came just within four decimal points of 1% on the real yield here, which is to me a sea change to see a full percentage point of 10 year real yield. We had a 600 point Dow swing from basically plus 200 it's to minus turnaround. 400. It's a huge shift, a huge disappointment. What was the landing that we had earlier this morning? Soft. Soft. That's yeah, it. We were very I, I soft. Don't think, I don't think anyone's talking about that right <laughs> yeah. now. What you've heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell, from Vice Chair Lael Brainerd, from Mr. Waller, the governor over at the Federal Reserve, what you've also heard from Jim Bullard repeatedly. What yeah. are they going to say? This is exactly what we're talking about. This is not about Fed officials. This is about a narrative shift in markets. Markets catching up to what the Fed is looking at. And that will be the discussion through the remainder of the day as they parse through this data and say, what were we getting wrong when we assumed we would see disinflation? And we are not. And I think that is what's going to drive the trading action. So equities down, going into the opening bell about an hour away. We're down by 1.3% on the S&P 500. We talked about that move through the front end of the yield curve, through 360 on a two-year. That's a fresh high, fresh multi-year high at that as well for a two-year yield in America in the Treasury market. And on tens, up by six basis points, through 340. Jay Bryson standing by, the chief economist over at Wells Fargo. Jay, just initially your reaction to a much, much hotter CPI print. Well, I think, you know, Mike nailed it earlier. I mean, if, you, if there's any doubt at all about 75, uh, they're definitely going 75. And then, you know, Lisa, I think you had a very good uh, comment there as well. What does this mean about November? I mean, we thought they would be stepping it back to November, uh, to 50 in November. And <clears throat> at this point, you would say 75 um, is certainly right. going to be on the table there in November. Jay, how do you take this data, this financialization shock over to the real economy? What does this 830 number signal about potential slowdown in economic growth? Well, you, you know, Tom, um, I think what you're looking at here is there's two things that's going on with the inflation, right? One is that inflation is going to continue to eat into nominal income. And so what we've seen, if you're looking at real disposable income year over year, um, at least in July, it was down 3.7 percent. Um, and so you can't continue to have consumer spending grow if real income is contracting like that. So that, that's the first problem with inflation. The second problem is it puts the Fed into overdrive. And if they're in overdrive, overdrive, sooner or later they're going to make a policy mistake. And if we're talking 75, 75, 75, as for far as the eye can see, they're going to make that policy mistake and it potentially could put the economy into, into recession, which is what we think is going to happen early next year. Jay, why did almost all forecasters get this wrong? 
Well, there's, you know, there's there's a, a bunch of volatility on a month by month sort of basis here. Um, we were above consensus, but we weren't at um, 0 0.6. I, you know, I think the, the, the big thing here that's really pushing a lot of this, and, and this is why it's going to be hard to bring inflation down in the near term, is the shelter component. You know, the way they treat shelter, the way they treat housing in here comes in with a long lag. And we all know what's happened over the last year or so. Housing prices have exploded. Um, and it came into the CPI relatively slowly. It's coming in with a vengeance now. The problem is it's going to continue to come in um, as well. And so that's going to keep the CPI inflation rate elevated for the foreseeable future. Jay, many Fed officials have given us the impression that what they wanted was two or three softer inflation reports to rethink the trajectory of rate hikes. As Lisa mentioned, and you alluded to it, do you think this really disrupts their ability to say in November that we need to go a different direction? Well, yeah, I, I think, well, obviously we've got a lot of, of data coming out between here and, and, and November, so, you know, we'll, we'll see, right? But, you know, if they want to see two or three soft prints in a row, we've just set, reset uh, the clock back to zero right now. And so, um, you know, 75 obviously is on the table, I think, in November. We'll see what happens to the real economy. We, you know, we'll have, you know, two more um, employment reports between now and then. That'll be key. Um, so if you do see slowing in the real economy, maybe it backs off. But right now, we haven't seen a lot, tremendous amount of slowing in the real economy, and that keeps <coughs> these supersized rate hikes in, in play. Jay, can you tell me where you expect to see unemployment by year end? And at the moment, this Fed, as you know, is very, very focused on the one side of the mandate, bringing inflation lower. We're all trying to work out whether the two sides of the mandate come into more conflict as we get closer to year end. So our, our view, um, John, is at the end of the year, you're looking at an unemployment rate somewhere around 3.7 or so. So I think that's still a very, very tight labor market. Now, as we go into early next year <coughs> and as we see, uh, you know, de deceleration and then uh, contraction in economic activity, I think that's when you see the unemployment rate start to move. But if we're still at 3.7 or let's say we're still below 4%, you know, we still have a three handle at the end of this year. I don't think the Fed is slowing down at that point. What does this say, Jay, about the inertial force of supposed disinflation? I think we're talking about getting to 5 or 4% inflation out there, but do we blow that up today and say simply our path is to get to 7 or 6.9% inflation? Well, Tom, I do believe that you are going to continue to see. So our view that inflation starts to recede next year is predicated on our view that you do have a recession. And if you do have a recession, then what you do see is goods prices will definitely start to decelerate, as will service prices um, as well. The, you know, the good thing, if there's anything that, that's good here, is that we have not seen inflation expectations become, quote, unmoored. That's a, that's a word that the Fed will, you know, uses all the time. Um, and so that's a good thing because if that does become unmoored, then that creates its, its, its own <clears throat> dynamic as well. People start to pull forward their expenditures, which pushes up inflation. They ask for higher and higher wage increases as well. Fortunately, we haven't mm -hmm. seen it become unmoored. But if you continue to start to see, you know, continue to see prints like this, then you <clears throat> do start to worry about that happening. Right. For all of you on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Dr. Jay Bryson with us with Wells Fargo here. A stunning inflation report. John, is that the right word? I think you can call I mean, it just that. Stunning, it's certainly stunning, an upside surprise, Tom. Stunning inflation report. Futures uh, turn around. A co I'm doing the math in my head, John. Help me out here. 2.5% flip-flop in what we see and on S&P futures. And some on the NASDAQ 100. Yeah, and some. We're down 2.4%. Yes. Yeah. This disrupts the idea that this Fed can back away anytime soon, Tom, it's a bit of a reality Well, I'll go check. with the disruption or just to say that we got to rip up the script and come up with a whole new dialogue. We do that with Michael McKee, who's uh, dived into the inflation report a little more. Michael, what is the distinction between service dynamic and goods dynamic? Well, right now, it looks like services are starting to pick up some speed here. Uh, services less energy rise by six-tenths of a percent. That's after four-tenths last month, and now services are up 6.1 percent over the year. So we are seeing service prices <coughs> start to rise, and you can see it in a number of areas. Interestingly, education, tuition, college tuition, it's time for kids to go back to school, and that was up half a percent, a fairly strong increase for that category. I'm so, yeah. <laughs> You would know something about that, Tom. Uh, we're also seeing uh, 
uh, uh, uh, motor vehicle insurance up 1.3 percent. That's been an ongoing issue. And airline fares fell 4.6 percent, but they had fallen 7.8 percent the month before. So we're losing a little of the benefit uh, from that. So you are seeing services rise. Uh, there was one thing I did want to mention. Somebody asked me this morning if we could mention this because uh, it matters to senior citizens. The consumer price index for urban wage earners was up 8.7 percent. We'll have to see what the uh, ne the average numbers come out to be uh, once September's numbers come in, but that will lead into the Social Security COLA. And if oh. you're looking at an 8.7 percent increase, that's going to be pretty you big. See that? From London, was it, was he's he looking at me. I'm in London and McKee's looking at me. Mike McKee, it's good to hear from you, sir. It's great to have you break that down for us alongside Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo. I'm going to totally avoid that and focus on this market. That month over month core print at 0.6%, when we were looking for 0.3, it's much hotter than anticipated. Yes. And you can see how the market's reacting to all of this. Equities negative, really rolling over, and yields really punching higher at the front end. A two year, Lisa, back through <clears throat> 360. When was the last time we could say that? <laughs> it's been a while. It's been close to the highs that we've seen this year, and those would be the highest levels going back. Uh, some, uh, some, 2007? Yeah, 2007. More than, uh, more than a decade, more than. Yeah, wow. More is this data dependency? I know exactly how long <laughs> Are we living data dependency? Out. Can I just say yes, but just one more thing. I was doing sure. some reading and uh, of the reaction that people were saying and the number of people saying the likelihood of a 75 basis point rate hike, just like we were hearing from Jay Bryson, is growing in November. Not just September, in November. So all of a sudden you start seeing that disagree. get priced into disagree. the yeah. Fed funds futures. Yeah. That's a new level of tightening. You're asking the right question. It's not about next week. It's about what happens after that, Tom. Yeah, it does. And of course, some of that comes back to economic growth. And it comes back to the tea leaves all of us in economics, finance, and investment glean from the short term bond market. We're going to do that right now. Ira Jersey joins us, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, what should we watch in your space, your world? What will give us the signals off this shock report? Yeah, I think it's that two-year yield that you guys were just highlighting and the fact that we're at levels where we haven't been since before the global financial crisis back in 2007. Um, you know, the, the the fact is, is that we had continued to to price for the Federal Reserve to uh, continue to hike interest rates. The question still is, how high do they go and then how long do they hold them there? And I think, you know, a lot of the data from this report, and, you know, it, it's always just one report, but when you get one report again and again and again, that tends to look at things like core service prices continuing to grow as quickly as they are, um, then, you know, the, the Federal Reserve has to worry that th that inflation is going to stay well above their 2% target for a long time. In fact, I, you know, I think you know, and some investors that that I've been talking to are questioning whether or not they can actually keep that two percent target as their as their guidepost. That maybe they need to be at two and a half percent or three percent or have some range between you know two and four or something like that. Because because it, we're we're in an environment where. Um, where it's very likely that inflation is going to stay this high or, well, not, not this high, but above 2% for several years. And, and that means that, that they're not going to ever hit their target unless they, uh, unless they hike interest rates more than the market's pricing. And that's the Adam Posen view of perhaps targeting 3% rather than 2%. But they are not doing that right now, Ira. And we are hearing from Fed officials talking up a 4% Fed funds rate as a likelihood early next year, or middle next year. How mispriced is that in markets right now? And do you think that that's realistic? Well, the, the market's getting there. So the market's priced for uh, for around the upper band to be about four percent. And uh, I think, in and my view is, is that the upper band eventually will be at around four and a half. So, um, and and Bloomberg Economics, of course, is even a little bit higher than that. And and certainly, you know, directionally, I think that the market needs to start pricing for somewhere above four percent in terms of uh, in terms of the Fed funds rate. We're not quite there yet. When you see two-year yields upwards right. of around three seventy-five, three ninety, that's that'll be a signal that we're we're finally there and we're getting yeah. there and we're getting there quickly. John Farrell, CIBC World Markets in Toronto, they focus on shelters, we've talked, but they also add medical care as part of this core surge that we've it seen. It goes back to this persistent thing. Yeah. How much longer is inflation going to remain at these kind of levels? Ira, can you talk to me about this move we're seeing in the two year? You picked up on it, let's discuss it. We're basically at 370 now on a two year yield. We're not far away from it. Ira, <laughs> how much upside do you think there actually might be on a two-year based on where it is now? 
Yeah, so our, our year-end target is uh, 390, and that and that's predicated on the idea that the Fed's going to hike to around four and a half percent, and then in 2024 start to cut. But yeah, you know, you get another CPI print or two similar to this, and and we'll have to rethink that view in a pretty big way. I, I think, you know, two-year yields are going to certainly be much more um, sensitive to uh, to the uh, what the Federal Reserve <laughs> is doing than than say the 10-year yield. And and I think the important bit is is that eventually the 10-year yield is going to really lag behind. I mean, it already has for about almost 2% over the last year. But um, but I do think that, that the 10-year yield eventually will start to rally a little bit on the idea that, look, the Fed has right. to hike a lot more than they want to, and we're going to have a hard landing. So, so the yield curve will just invert more and more. What will you listen for from the Fed? How do they change their dialogue off this report? To me, it, it completely – I mean, it vindicates what Powell was talking about at Jackson Hole. How do they move forward? Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah, you know, I don't think that they really have to change the, the narrative very much at all. The Fed's been pretty consistent. The market just hasn't believed them, or large parts of the market haven't <laughs> believed them. Look, all the investors that, that we've talked to, that, that I talked to, are in two camps. One is the Fed's way behind the curve. They have to hike a lot more. They need to go 100 basis points at the September meeting and then uh, and, and keep going to, you know, 5 6 7%. And then you have another group of investors that's saying the Fed can't go much beyond 4% because they're already going to be pricing in for a recession and a hard landing and all these other things. So, so you have this very bifurcated view where where everything centers around maybe what we're pricing right now, but but you have these two very disparate views. And and as people shift from one of those views to the other, you're seeing these these very big moves in markets. And and liquidity has been pretty poor um, as well because there's structural issues going on in the treasury market. So you're going to continue to see these 10, 15, 20 basis point moves on a pretty regular basis as as the sentiment shifts so so significantly. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, thank you. I think some people might argue going into that Fed meeting next week that the chairman should just take the speech from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, bring it out and just read it again. <laughs> I mean, this is it, isn't it? I, I, you know, we're living this, and I think we're hugely biased in New York, John, and maybe you're biased we're in, London. in London as well. No, but I mean, in New York, we're living this rental buying oh, sure. selling reality a lot, a lot of the country how do you substitute that if i like if i like budweiser and it goes up i can substitute sure. to miller champagne of bottled beers how do you substitute your rent i take it a step further lisa brought this up i remember was it a month two months ago you brought up the mortgage costs yeah it's really what do they buy, do right exactly. so a lot of people are left with no option other to, to rent well, well, the, right this is sort of counterintuitive because if you get higher costs to buy, you would think that that would tighten the labor market yeah. or tighten the housing market and then that would reduce housing costs, right? But in fact, it increases the cost of renting and you're seeing that across the board. It is a different week here in London. We've had a pause today in the uh, services for Queen Elizabeth and it's allowed us to actually catch up with members of our wonderful London team. One of them who you've heard often in America on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, is Marcus Ashworth. To say he writes for Bloomberg Opinion barely describes his market excellence with service at Barclays over the years and 14 other uh, institutions that you and I <laughs> have forgotten about have been merged into uh, oblivion. Marcus, wonderful to catch up with you today. What does this stunning report mean for Governor Bailey, who the day after the Fed meeting has to adapt and adjust to the central banker in the inflation of the world? I, when I I saw his report. The first thing I thought was ouch for America, but double ouch the rest of the world. But, you know, the dollar is just going to is killing everything, and it's now killing it even more. And you know, two yields up where they are. Which, to my mind, it's one number. We've got to look at these data and think that no one can measure inflation properly. Um, some of the central banks have, have, have opened up to that fact. So let's not get too focused on one report. Nonetheless, it does look pretty unfortunate. Everyone had gone one way and expecting not a Fed pivot. But that there was enough ammunition at some point, there would be a reason to have a Fed pivot. That's just been swept away. It's a reality check. Yeah, it's a reality check when, you know, uh, Powell had given that to us at Jackson Hole. Totally. But now's the data proving it. And that's awful for the UK. It's even more awful I think for it's Europe, more than a and let alone market. emerging markets. It's a disaster. It's a very bad print. Well, because the US are going to overdo it and they're going to break something. And what they're going to break is the rest of the world. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the bank around the corner on Threadneedle Street, the Bank of England. Tom raised the question, are we at that point now where we can just call it what it looks like it is, which is a little bit of a war? It's like the reverse of the FX war we had maybe 10 years ago. 
Is that what we have? Well, the only good thing about the UK is that they're making the most stupid mistake ever trying to fiscally tighten uh, under Rishi Sunak. That's gone away. This, this new government is going to do unwind everything he did in the last sort of uh, year or so. Post furlough, um, we're going to get a very big um, fiscal stimulus, which is what's needed. And we should have never had the tightening to start off with. So that's the only good thing going, I think, for the UK in that sense. Sterling's already really cheap. Um, in that sense, yes, they can hike. I don't think they need to hike quite so much uh, than perhaps other central banks do because the consumer hit a brick wall in February in this country. And I think, therefore, yeah. we've got quantitative tightening, which is the first one to do active. That probably comes uh, this month or next month. That's, that's going to be a, a quite a big impact. John, I know to Lisa, but 115.83 on sterling is a wow shift. It's not 114, and that's the good news, because it was threatening to break through 114. Yeah, two-thirds of the way there. Yeah. Where we are right now in this bond market, Bramo, is where I think we both want to go. Right. We're at five basis points on a 10-year at 340. We've all got that long list of people who said we've seen the highs of the year. I right. wonder if they have to rethink that, because the highs of the year on a 10-year are about 10 basis points now. On a two-year already through them. We, as you were saying before, we are through those highs and we are now at the highest level going back to November 2007, even on an intraday level. And this really raises question from the international perspective about whether some of the other uh, central banks are only hiking to keep pace with the United States and not because they, their economies necessarily need this. And Marcus, I do wonder from your perspective whether it is uh, probably going to be viewed as a mistake or you're going to see a reversion to rate cuts more quickly in Europe, in the United Kingdom, because there is not the strength to back it up and the weakness will become more pronounced more quickly. Well, I mean, the pain in the UK is, as I said, somewhat softened by this big fiscal package which is coming. In Europe, I really worry. Because you know we've got so much uh, problems coming through on the on the German economy in particular, and you know, the European Central Bank seems to got the zeal that it needs to hike 75 basis points to exactly to keep up with the Fed, and that's the problem. I think the, the rest of the world is going to be broken at some point. That will feed through to the U.S. economy, and they might stop hiking. We're out of time. 30 seconds. Credit Suisse, your expert. What if they breach five euros, five whatever? per share. What are the ramifications? Well, I think Credit Suisse is just what it's good at. It's private wealth management and one or two other things. I think they have to go back to core, get rid of the risk culture. But, you know, intrinsically, it's a decent bank, and I don't think it'll be bought out, so there's no, okay. no M&A premium, unfortunately. Swiss francs, TK. I Swiss can't keep track. Oh, you can. Okay. You, you love the Swissy. And the SMB. I, I don't like it because you, you, you go to the McDonald's and Bond <laughs> I think, I think about what they've got to do. Yeah. Yeah. The SMB, the Bank of England. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've all discussed it, haven't we? <clears throat> ECB's got 75. Fed's about to go 75. Looks nailed on now yeah. into next week. Day after, Bank of England. They've got to do the same thing. It's the summer of 75, isn't that what Citigroup said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The summer of 75. I missed that. Yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah. I think Is that Hollenhorst? Yeah, I think so. I wasn't listening to him. Was that, was that this morning? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't this morning. It was in a note. No, no, it was not this morning. It was a couple right. of weeks ago in a note. He said, this is summer of 75. I and I think that's yeah. about right. Jennifer O'Neill was in that movie. Oh, really? She was. Okay. Yeah. Summer of 75. I'm going to whip through the price action. I just said to the market. Just let's just get that. Inflation came in 25 minutes ago hotter than anticipated. Month over month core is where this market was focused. Month over month core came in with a big upside surprise. That means equities lower. We're down 2% on the S&P 500 We continue now. to deteriorate. Euro yeah, dollar, right, yeah. big turnaround, negative three quarters of 1%. That's a weaker euro, much stronger dollar. Talked a lot about the moves across the bond curve. Twos out to tens, tens up by six or seven basis points, 342. Where's your two year now? It's 170. I mean, 370. 370. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> like 170. Well, I mean, I got very that. comfortable with the one handle for a long time. Right? Then two, and now it seems three is the place to be. 370. And Ira Jersey of Bloomberg was talking up 390. Yeah, it's beyond 370. Well, if you think about a base case that markets are pricing in, that you're going to see a 4% John. Fed funds rate and they're going to hold it there for a longer period of time, well, it makes right. a lot of sense. John, 700 Dow points, most of that in the last 20 minutes. Where are we at 3 p.m., 4 p.m. today? Seriously. 1,000 points? We're going to ask Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College. He's going to what join a reset. Us alongside Estee Dweck of Floyd Bank, David yeah, Kelly of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. TK and I have worked together for so long. <laughs> I, I've, I've learned to ignore him <laughs> at specific times, particularly around the time he mentions Dow points. And how many points? 700 Thank you. points. Thank These you. are huge moves. Thank Look you. at the NASDAQ you mentioned earlier. Yeah. The NASDAQ is huge. Big move mm. lower in this equity market. We'll break it all down for you in just a moment. Upside surprise on CPI in America. That means a big downward move on this equity market. The countdown to the <coughs> open, just around a corner. With 35 minutes away, this is Bloomberg.
This is an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from London for our audience worldwide, counting you down to the opening bell. Good afternoon from London. Good morning to your stateside, waiting for that cash open with equity futures dramatically lower, down by 2% on the S&P 500, negative by 29 on the Nasdaq. TK off the back of a much, much hotter than expected CPI report in America. With global ramifications, there's no question about it. Let's go to the States. We're going to go to Anne-Marie Horton and what the White House response will this will be uh, here in the half hour. But, John, I really want to emphasize how many people got this wrong in one lone voice at Jackson Hole nailed it? Chairman Powell himself, we've got work to do, and everybody else has followed him on that Federal Reserve. This market, though, some participants, Lisa, ignoring that Fed communication, waiting for that soft landing. Some of the data recently spoke to that. This data point did not. No, and that's the reason why I find it fascinating that the knee-jerk reaction in markets is as dramatic as it is. People really have believed that the Fed had it wrong and that they were right and that there was just dis disinflationary tilt and you were going to see uh, inflation slow much more than it actually has. This raises a lot of questions about what's in assumptions and how much further the sell-off has to go. To Tom's point, it will be very interesting to see how the White House responds to this yes. because the month-over-month -month numbers have come in much hotter than anticipated. We talked about the front page of the newspaper going with the headline numbers. Wall Street was looking at month over month core and you said even within month over month core you need to go deeper. It doesn't speak to a story that's fading anytime soon. No, it came in double where people had expected it to. If you look at month and a month core inflation and when it comes to the White House's response, this comes at a difficult time when President Biden is now about to campaign on the fact that they're getting inflation under control and people are less worried about inflation. He's pointing to gasoline prices. This flies in the face of that narrative. I wonder if he's well. rewriting some of those speeches. Think it's him? I, I, well, whoever's writing those speeches. <laughs> exactly. As is often the case yeah, of any administration, it's exactly. usually someone else. Equity's down, <clears throat> yields up, it's twos out to tens, your ten year yield is much higher, your two year. Well, You've now got to get used to 370 on a two year, Tom. Can you get used to 370 on no, a two year? No, I cannot. And moments ago, a massive moment for these markets in the years that we've been doing this, the ten year real yield at 1.00%. It is, John, the signal of that. For those of you that aren't on Global Wall Street, John, explain why 1.00, 10-year, the real yield, why that's important. Toxic for risk assets. And those kind of levels remind me of where we were in late 2018, where the equity market, let's right. face it, collapsed. <clears throat> Some people might not like that I word. And yields, spreads on credit. Lisa, they were much, much wider than where they are now. For years, there was no alternative. Now there is an alternative because you're actually getting yields and income from some of these instruments. And that, I think, is the big takeaway from real yields climbing. Mike McKee is going to join us now to break down some of this economic data. Mike, this wasn't the number many people were looking for. No, some people were thinking that way on Wall Street, but uh, let's go through some of the numbers that are making you three so gloomy this morning. Uh, the month-over-month -month CPI comes in at one-tenth of a percent, which is higher than the negative tenth of a percent that had been expected. So we see the headline fall to 8.3 percent from 8.5. But the core is the one you're talking about was up six-tenths of a percent. Last month was three-tenths. The forecast was three-tenths. So we see the core rate rise to 6.3 percent from 5.9 percent. I'm guessing Joe Biden will not be talking about the core rate this afternoon. What moved in the indexes? Well, you could see there gasoline kept its part of the bargain. It fell 10.6 percent. We knew that that had gone down quite a bit. Yeah. But food has not reversed. People were thinking when the commodities started to fall in July that we would see a drop in food prices. We don't. We certainly don't see a drop in shelter prices. Owners equivalent rent is up. Used cars were down down a tenth of a percent, but on a wholesale basis, the expectation was they might be down as much as one to one and a half percent. So that's a disappointment. And apparel prices, no sell off of inventory there. They're still rising two tenths of a percent on the month. Now, uh, just a few months ago, you had uh, Ira Jersey on who said that the Fed is going to be determined to get up to restrictive territory. And as we watch what's happening in the futures markets and people are pricing in 75 mm. now for the September meeting and a possibility of 75 for the November meeting. You can see here that uh, the Fed in the past has always raised interest rates 
above the level of CPI, right. both CPI and core. And you can see all the way over on the left, on the right there, they're a long way from that. So we need inflation to come down or mm -hmm. we need the Fed rate to go up. Uh, before you're probably going to see much success at bringing overall inflation lower. Mike, very quickly here, if I was having a beverage of my choice at Jackson Hole for with any selected Fed presidents, what would they say is the distance to neutrality? Is it November? Is it into next year? When is the when of getting to neutral? Generally, the feeling has been they want to be there by the end of the year, and that gives them two more meetings to do it. So then you have to define what neutral is. Some of them think three and a half. Some of them think four or a little above. So that gives you a wide parameter of possibilities for raising rates over the next couple of meetings. Uh, Tom, I can also point out that uh, you probably helped because uh, obviously supply not keeping up with demand with those beverages of your choice. Alcoholic beverages up Thank nine you. tenths during the month of August. I can tell you that's a true story. Mike McKee, thank you. As I sit there with a pot of tea and Tom's on martini number four, as is often the case around dinner, not breakfast. That's impressive. Thank you. It's around dinner and not yeah. breakfast. Krishna thank Mamani's you. with us of Lafayette College, the CIO. Krishna, you've got to respond to this one for us. Uh, equities down and down hard. I think I've got the S&P off 2%. Granted, over the last four days, we were up about 5%. But your thoughts on what we got 35 minutes ago? Well, so I, I think uh, Jay Powell basically laid it out from a policy standpoint. And if you focus on that, nothing has really changed that much in that, you know, inflation is high and they will continue to tighten. And if you are looking for a pivot, you are, you, you know, last few uh, days and probably last few weeks, uh, you turbocharge your expectations and you'll probably be giving all of that back. The bottom line is the Fed is looking to get it to 4% or higher. Uh, and they will get there either this year or uh, uh, early next year. Uh, the real question for the market is one, how long do they stay at that uh, terminal rate uh, north of 4% and uh, will they pivot because of something breaking? I think that's what we are dealing with. Uh, kind of looking at this month's number, uh, contrasted with the last month's number, we, did, we didn't have as much of a reason to be as optimistic last month and this month, probably, if we project it too much, there's probably not too much of a reason for us to be that pessimistic. Inflation is slowing down, but not at the pace that the Fed is comfortable with. And that's what the markets have to deal with. So what's your sense of when it is a good time to, to go into to go into debt, to go into duration, to start saying we have seen the highs in the 10 year because we are going to get up to 4% or beyond, and that's going to lead inflation to get under control. Do you get more of a sense of that now with a CPI print? Well, no, so I, I would say that both the, the, the Treasury markets and the credit markets are probably a lot more vulnerable than the equity markets for the very simple reason that we really don't know at what level the Fed is going to uh, stop and at how long they would stay at that level. That's really not a very conducive environment uh, for owning, uh, owning credit assets or for that matter, owning safe assets. I think there will be a time, but it certainly is not today. Equity markets, at least you can make a case that the valuations have come down and uh, you know, if we are not in a recession and probably don't get into a recession, it probably may not be such a bet, uh, such a bad bet, given the, the upside. In in the bond markets, you don't have that at the moment. Well, but Krishna, a lot of people would say that stock and bond markets have been moving in lockstep and that when bonds sell off, so do stocks, particularly big tech, which has driven a lot of the activity. So what's your pushback to that to say, no, equity still can be a haven at a time when debt <clears throat> instruments are at the uh, precipice of the volatility? Well, so if you look at the last few weeks, you know, equity markets did reasonably well despite bond markets selling off. So almost 30 odd basis point rise in rates and probably higher than that by now, uh, and, and equities, equities held up uh, reasonably well. So the, I'm, I'm not saying equities are not vulnerable. What I am saying, however, given the up potential upside from any change that may come in the environment, equities, you can capture that uh, upside. In, in bonds, you have, it's far riskier. Krishna, very importantly, and this is to institutional Wall Street, we are going to see new lows in price for the various Bloomberg aggregate indexes. 
What's going to be the blood on the streets institutionally of new lower bond prices with higher yields? Well, so, you know, I, I think from a, from a longer term perspective, as Lisa had indicated before, we really did not have much of a choice other than owning equities. And that option is being created. At some point, we will get to terminal rate. At some point, the Fed will pivot. And therefore, I think bond assets, <clears throat> they, they may not be at their, uh, at their lows just yet. But from a longer term perspective, bonds are becoming a much more viable asset class than they have been over the last you know, five, 10 years. And that is, uh, you know, that is really good for uh, the institutional world. You know, if you kind of go back, what the world wants is a good bond with the high enough yield. If they can get that, they don't care about equities. And uh, hey, Christian, that, you know, that's what we, all want. We, we are getting closer to that. We're getting closer. Krishna, I've got to ask you this. We're getting closer to the Fed next week. Everyone's going to say 75. I get that. Can you tell me what you think the forecasts are going to look like next week? Because we do get the new refreshed summary of economic projections. What kind of shape do you think that's going to take? Well, so, you know, they perhaps have been a bit more optimistic than they should have been. And, you know, a lot of commentators have kind of uh, chided them for that. And, and I think that would probably still be true. The, the real question is, what do they do over the next few meetings and how quickly do they get to the terminal rate that they are striving for? And I think if today's data is any indication, they would probably hurry it up because right now the economy is in a good <clears throat> enough shape where they can take that, uh, take that risk and the, it, the economy can take that punishment. So uh, my expectation would be that rate increase uh, expectations have to be brought forward. That's what the Fed wants to do. They want to get to the terminal rate as fast as they possibly can and then hopefully hold there. Whether they will be able to hold there is a separate question altogether. Hey, Krishna, thank you. Krishna Mamali there of Lafayette College. Off the back of this hotter than expected CPI report and going into the Federal Reserve next week, I've got to squeeze this in because you know someone's asking me. I know. Quiet period. No Fed speak. No Fed speak. That's think, the reason why. Do you think they might? We might wanna, get something from you know, one particular reporter at the Wall Street Journal to basically not, say, not saying, you but know, honestly, what are they going to say that they haven't already said? I hear you. I mean, they have been very deliberate and they have been very vocal and united in saying, we're going to hike rates. And you people have that. chosen to ignore them. Right. Now, Tom, in the summary of economic projections that we get next week, are you expecting to see inflation adjusted higher, growth lower, dots out there I... up by four and... For a whole lot they longer. will manage the message and it'll all be vector based and they'll do it with great gradual approach, which they do. I want to look at the right now, which is under no circumstances, John, here now, one hour after this folly, 45 minutes after this folly, have we seen a bid? We've got Dow 800 points. We're going to get a Dow negative 1,000 here. We're going to get a VIX out, two big figures. The SPX, of course, is what institutional Wall Street's uh, looking at. These are markets on the move this, this afternoon. The S&P 500 down by more than 2%, yeah. the Nasdaq 100 down by 2.9% going into the opening bell, 17 minutes away. Wow. In just a moment, we'll catch up with Flowbank CIO SD Dweck on some of the price action, and we'll speak to AMH down in DC on what the White House might have to say about this. This is Bloomberg. We are 13 minutes away from the opening bell in New York City, and equities are down and down hard. Negative 2.35% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq 100, down by three full percentage points after a hotter than expected inflation report in America. Joining us from Washington now, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. AMH, let's talk about it. How is the president going to respond to this one? Well, it's kind of an awkward moment because at 3 p.m. later today, he's going to be gathered with members of Congress, his cabinet, environmentalists, mayors to talk about this historic legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is massive legislation. They decided to call it Inflation Reduction Act for a reason. They knew this was going into the midterm elections, going to be one of the, the biggest issues. This, of course, has money going towards a climate change, a 15 percent corporate minimum tax. We make uh, over a billion dollars as a corporation and lowering the cost of Medicare. But how much is the president going to be able to stick that message with the fact that inflation today is higher? I imagine the one piece of spin that they're going to want to really grapple with is that they worked all summer to try to bring gasoline <clears throat> prices down. 
from where it was at the June peak of over $5 a, a gallon to now just under $4 a gallon with uh, $3.70. That was the one bright spot of this inflation mm -hmm. report. But obviously, just less than two months away from the midterm elections, Republicans are really going to harp on this. Emory, which party is advantaged by sustained inflation? That would be the Republicans going into the midterm elections, right? Because they're the ones that can say, uh, look, inflation is not coming down. It was not transitory, something that this White House, something that the Treasury down the block from me had told <laughs> us it would be. So it's the Republicans that want to make sure that this message is top of mind of voters, of consumers, higher food prices, higher electricity bills. If you look at the inflation report, yeah, gasoline is coming down, but natural gas and electricity is higher, higher rents. All of this is being eclipsed if you're not getting the wage gains, and that's their biggest problem. But the one thing the Democrats do have with some wind in their sails following you know, the strike down of Roe v. Wade is that this is now a live issue. We saw that in that congressional district, that swing district in New York. We saw that in Kansas. And there was a recent Wall Street Journal poll that said, yes, overall, economy is number one for voters to go to the polls. Number two was abortion and women's health care and reproductive rights. And number three was inflation. And Marie, thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be a reset uh, down in Washington, D.C. as President Biden tries to double down on a message. It's a little cloudier after this latest data. Of course, the message is a little cloudier in markets. Esty Dweck, CIO of Flowbank, joining us now. We are seeing uh, NASDAQ down 2.9 percent, a reset of the idea of a disinflationary tilt that we thought would take hold but didn't. Are you rethinking any of your positions today? Well, it was never going to be a straight line down. We have a number of inflation data points that are still showing that uh, disinflation is happening. Clearly, uh, the core print for today was not fantastic, and we're seeing the disappointment in markets, especially because we had that expectations in the last couple of days that really ramped up and, and boosted markets. Uh, from a positioning perspective, we still have PPI tomorrow. We have the Michigan numbers uh, coming up at the end of the week. We had inflation expectations in the last couple of days showing us that those have come down quite sharply as well. So uh, I think the disinflation trend is going to continue, but for today, it's definitely going John. to be ugly. John, we're getting in the numbers right now. Peter Bookfire has one of the isolated incidents, health insurance up 24% year over year. Services. Services is the yeah. distinction feature. Here. Without a doubt. Esty, yeah. with that in mind, we've got this tug of war between financial conditions and what is happening with the data and how the Fed is responding to it and investors who are hoping all of this goes away and next year it's smooth sailing. What's your message to people that still doubt the resolve of this Federal Reserve? Well, there wasn't going to be a pivot and there clearly isn't going to be a pivot anytime soon. I think Jackson Hole dispelled that idea completely. Anything that anything close to a pivot would just mean we're going to stop hiking. And that, you know, happens at some point in 2023. And how many more percentage they get in before that, uh, that number is going up, of course, for the with the November expectations rising as well. Uh, but the Fed isn't going to blink. Inflation is gradually coming down slower than anyone would like. Uh, but their resolve is going to be very firm. Mm -hmm. Esty, where do I hide? Just as simple as that. <laughs> My head is spinning. <laughs> this report wasn't what I expected. Where do I hide to drag myself into 2023? So I think it's a bit too early to say that the entire end of the year is going to be bad. I think at some point we are going to have some improvement in markets. For the time being, it feels really like the dollar is a great place to hide. The Swiss franc, you were talking earlier about the Swiss National Bank uh, coming in with those hikes. So Swiss franc probably uh, is another place to hide. But you're, you know, you're making something in cash. And I think a lot, of it, a lot of investors are going to be happy to sit in cash and wait uh, for the picture to improve, uh, hopefully, over the next couple of weeks. Esty, thank you. Esty Dweck there at Flow Bank. Tom with the money question. Where do you hide when equities are down and yields up and treasuries are getting battered? And that's what we're seeing on tens, on twos. I had a message just a moment ago from a Bloomberg Terminal subscriber. There goes Goldilocks. You remember after payrolls report, yes. I said it, I sat there looking at that one specific data point. It spoke to that theme. 
the inflation report <coughs> just wiped the floor with that idea because this Fed has got a whole lot more work to do. I keep thinking about what Ira Jersey said, particularly with quantitative tightening picking up, and that we weren't going to see the effects of that until early next year, when all of a sudden banks are going to have to go out and actually pay people more to put their deposits with them. And at what point do we get more and more people just parking their money then in their, in their checking accounts because you're actually getting something for it suddenly? Where does QT fit in here? You know, this is the question because it's accelerating right now. This week, it actually is right. starting to accelerate. So. As Ira was saying, we haven't really seen much effect of it yet. Will we start to see the ramifications of that in a <clears throat> withdrawal of liquidity from the financial system more sustainably early next year? Can we get the yield curve up to 10s and 30s? Because every time I check, I notice we're a little bit higher. Yeah. 374 close to yeah, yeah. on a two year. And what are we now? Four or five basis points away from the high of the year on a 10 year. Yeah. After many people for the last several months through basically the whole of summer said the June 14th high, that was the high for the year on a 10 year and here we are staring down the barrel of a fresh high. Yeah, we're going to look at yield curve inversion, deep yield curve inversion, a reinversion after a better lesser inversion that we saw a couple weeks ago. 343 Tom. Was this bad year. news is bad news or was this bad I news? I think bad news is bad, bad news, news on this front without it. a doubt. I will say on a math basis people tell me interview to interview convexity in bonds doesn't matter. I would look for acceleration in lower prices. No one believes it's there. Two it's tens, a bear market. Negative 30. Two tens, I believe prices 30. lower. It's that, is, is that how it works. And, and there's a second derivative. Everybody's going, no, bonds are different. I'm like, okay. Uh, it's been tough. Maybe. You've said the price loss on bonds this year, Tom. To our Brutal. listeners and viewers is tangible. They're not doing fancy pants spread market stuff. David Kelly of JP. They're Marvel, watching the asset Dow. Management. I'm not sure David is. You can ask him. David is, you but can ask our, David. our viewers and listeners know David. we're down 700 points in the swing. They're watching the Dow, but Tom, they're allocated to. The that SMP. would be accurate. Sure. Very good. Okay, we, we agree, agree on something. There we I'm go. Beautiful. Happy families. families. Oh yeah. Oh, this is Bloomberg. Thank you. <laughs>from London for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. We are seconds away from the opening bell. That is your opening bell in the United States of America. Equity futures going into that cash open, getting absolutely hammered. Down by 2.25% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, down by almost 3 In the FX market, a dollar a whole lot stronger, snapping back euro dollar just about above parity, 10022, negative 1% 1 on that currency pair. Yields are flying, up by seven basis points on a 10-year to 342.73, and a two-year through 370. You've got to go all the way back to 2007 for those kind of levels. That's the cross-asset price action with some movers at the open. Let's get to Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do, of course, have this very risk-off day, a uh, bearish tone for stocks. That S&P 500 heading to its worst day in about three weeks. It has everything to do, of course, with that hot CPI report, hotter than expected. That means yields are higher, as you were just outlining. And the big, big key driver, the dollar, as you were just mentioning, stronger, up about nine-tenths of one percent, the best day since two weeks. That is pressing stocks overall, but those yields higher is really weighing on big tech in particular, Apple and NVIDIA, uh, both lower as yields higher means value valuation comes into question. But you can see J.P. Morgan Chase banks not benefiting from yields being higher. That's because that yield curve is coming in because the big action is on the short end. So that is really weighing uh, on the banks overall. And then we even had a reversal in oil lower on that hot CPI print because of that dollar shooting higher. That has pushed oil lower. We also have the uh, energy sector lower. What's so interesting about this, John, is this reaction felt knee jerk, but it's holding on for an hour. Let's see if it makes it through the first half hour of trading or the trading day overall. Will it stick? Abby, thank you. Bramo, if I'd said to you at the start of the year that yields would be where they are and that the Fed would get Fed funds rate to where it is and higher again next week, perhaps by 75, most people assume that's the case wasn't a big consensus trade to get along the financials, yep, along the was, banks. Yes, and we were talking about this yesterday, right, that this has been the trade that can't seem to work because it's accompanied by the prospect of weakness that has to be engineered by definition, particularly in the labor market, in order to achieve a decline in that inflation and, of course, the yield curve contracting. The overwhelming consensus right now in the fund manager survey is that growth is not going to be tremendous. We can talk about that fund manager survey right now with Kelly Lines. Hey, Kelly.
Hey, John, yeah, the title of this fund manager survey really says it all. They titled it Les Miserables because they call it super bearish. A record 52% of investors surveyed are underweight equities and a record 62% are overweight cash with cash levels moving up to about 6.1%. Global growth expectations also right around an all-time low. 72% expect a weaker economy next year with the most people expecting a recession since May of 2020. Now, typically that level of bearishness is actually bullish and Bank of America reads these results as a signal that the short-term pain trade is up for risk assets. Michael Hartnett saying the S&P could rise to 4,300, but he then expects the index to fall back, and he remains fundamentally and patiently bearish. As for the most crowded trades, perhaps no surprise, once again, long dollar is topping the list. 56% of investors gave that answer. That is the most extended position since long U.S. tech back in November 2020. Compare that to just 10% who answered number two, long commodities. And you also have long ESG, short treasuries, and long growth stocks in there as well. As for the biggest tail risks, inflation, fittingly today, given that hotter than expected CPI report, is number one, followed by hawkish central banks. Interestingly, a global recession moves this month from the number two spot to the number four spot, spot topped by geopolitical risk. And you also have a systemic credit event making the list as well, John. Miserable. Yeah. Eddie, thank you. Just doing the English version for anyone who didn't know how to translate that. Like Tom, sometimes. Oh, anyway. my God. Even He's still counting like, down. No, even better, you look now. like yeah. John. Yeah. Exactly. The resemblance to Hugh Jackman is extraordinary. Tom, on a serious note, <laughs> on a serious note, <laughs> that bearishness, does that explain the previous four days? And is it dated after the data point we got about an hour ago? I, I would suggest it mentions to managers fighting for their careers to the end of the year. This is brutal. And again, I'm going to watch the bond space. You're going to see a breakthrough of the total return aggregates of Bloomberg, price lower. We have never seen this before. David Kelly joins Ever. us now to talk about this, the chief global strategist at J.P. Morgan <clears throat> Asset Management. David, we've given everyone the opportunity to respond to the data so far. Mm -hmm. It's about an hour old now. Your response to it? No, it's, a, it's a little warmer than expected, but I'm not going to call one-tenth of a percent of an increase in prices a hot inflation report. What's happening is it's cooling. Uh, there are just a few hot spots. There, there are problems in getting all of inflation to come down, but the cooling trend is there. I think markets are overreacting to this. Uh, in particular, there's a big chunk of inflation, uh, the CPI, 32% is in shelter, and that's up seven-tenths of a percent. And that's really what's driving a lot of the underlying, uh, you know, resilience of inflation here. But a lot of that is, you know, owner's equivalent rent. It's a very, uh, you know, almost a mythical concept uh, because nobody actually pays owner's equivalent rent. So there are parts of inflation hanging on, but I think, I think it's really important to recognize the economy is cooling here. Uh, and a lot of the things that pushed up inflation are cooling off also. So we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't get messed up by, by the fact that it was a little higher than consensus here. The, rea the big story here is inflation is actually coming down. David, that is convenient for a lot of the bulls. And yet the story that people are seeing right now is that the hope was we would see a much faster disinflation that would get the Fed, not perhaps raising rates as much as they were saying. How can you lean against this? What parts of the market are most overreacting from your pr perspective? Well, you mentioned financials. Uh, and I think what, what's going on is uh, people are assuming that this will make the Fed a bit more hawkish. And I think that's true. I mean, I think that uh, the, the Fed will now have more of reason to go 75 basis points uh, next week, and I think that's what they'll do. I think the ECB obviously just did that. I think the Bank of England will do the same. Uh, but I think the Fed will also leave the door open to a smaller increase in November, maybe 50 basis points, maybe 25 basis points in December, because what they are going to see is, is inflation continuing actually to cool, because that, that's actually what's going on. I think we'll get about two-tenths of a percent in the September read. Uh, energy prices are going to be down month over month in September also. Uh, I think we'll see the airline fares come down a bit more. I think lodging will come down a bit more. We've got a big increase in tobacco prices. No reason why we get that two months in a row. So I, I just think we're, we're overreacting to this. Yes, it wasn't good news on inflation. It was worse than expected. But the, the big trend here is coming down. I think you know financials are overreacting. I, I, I have no problem with the 10-year Treasury up near 350. I think that's, that's OK. But I think the, the assumption that somehow we're not dealing with inflation or is going to get worse I think it's just wrong. What about big tech, Dave? I mean, David, we're looking right now at a 3.1% decline on the NASDAQ. Yeah. It has been a knee-jerk whipsaw lower, and it has had legs. Do you push against that? 
Not, not necessarily. I think you, you'd have to go stock by stock because it, the, the issue is there were a number of things that were overvalued based if you ever assumed a normal level of real interest rates. And we are getting back to a more normal level of real interest rates. And that is negative for, uh, for large cap uh, growth stocks, which, you know, which were standing at very high valuations. So I, I, I do get that. And I don't, you know, I don't, I think it's really more of a return to rationality in a lot of the pricing in markets. And that's no harm. Uh, but overall, I, you know, I, I, I'm actually a positive <laughs> in the equity market, and I'm, I'm glad to see so many people bearish because I think that that sets us up to do a bit better uh, over the next few months. David Kelly, what do you see among corporate earnings? We're, we're really before the gaming of what corporate earnings are doing, but let's get out front with you. How are corporations adapting to America's inflation? Well, it is it is difficult, and, I, and you know, last year we had a spectacular year for earnings. This year, it, we'll be lucky if we get a, get out with a or end the year with a positive on operating earnings year over year. I think it could be negative next year. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to see an inflation uh, or an earnings squeeze. I mean, I mean, the the reality is you've got this growth in wages that is real. Uh, companies can either pass it on or not, and I think they're going to find it hard to pass it on. And I think that's going to. Uh, squeeze <clears throat> margins next year. So I, I do think that whether we have a recession or not, we could end up with negative earnings growth next year. David, like everyone out there on my cell phone, I have a real estate dump of whatever geography I'm looking at. Doesn't everybody go out today and mark down the price of their house for sale? Um, yes, and it takes a long, long time for that market to clear. But the, but the reality is the average mortgage payment on a new home has gone up by 60% in the last year. And, and that, really, that one I do really blame the Federal Reserve for. They kept rates so low for so long that it caused a in prices, and now we can't deal with it. I don't think there's enough, enough people to buy homes when you push the, the average mortgage rate or average mortgage payment up by 60% in a year. John, I think this is just absolutely profound. I can't say enough about uh, sector to sector in inflation, the different elasticities that are out there on home ownership and how it redounds over to re rent multifamily nationwide. Every region's different. Guess what? This report is a game changer. And core inflation came in hotter than expected, and shelters are one of the most stickiest part of the report when it comes to inflation. And David, I appreciate what you're saying that things might be getting better, perhaps not worse. But when you think about what the Fed will do, not what they should do, mm -hmm. David, can you talk to me about what you expect they will do? They've laid out their reaction function. They've told us how they respond to incoming information. Tell us what you think that means for what they will do. Well, I, I think what they'll do is they'll go 75 basis points next week. But I do think that in the press conference and perhaps in the statement, they will acknowledge the fact that inflation has cooled somewhat, uh, but, but they'll say, you know, two data points are not good enough to, to, to call it a trend yet. So they'll have some caution there, but they'll put enough doubt in there to give them the space to only go 50 basis points in, in, in November. So I think, I think they want to set, set it up that way. They want, to, they want to put in a hawkish move, but give themselves the opportunity then to put in more dovish language without being labeled <clears throat> as being soft on inflation. Uh, but, you know, again, I would focus on, you know, this shelter thing, yeah, it's, it's a long lagging prob uh, problem in inflation. But if you think about it, how does higher interest rates help deal with a shelter inflation problem? I mean, if it stops people from building houses, how are you going to bring down rents? Uh, so it's, uh, that's the problem. It, you know, the, the, very, the one thing that, that they, they're most worried about or the one thing that's keeping inflation high is the thing that, that they can fix the least by pushing up interest rates. There you go. David Kelly of J.P. Morgan Asset Management is going to be sticking with us. Perhaps that's a question, Lisa, for the news conference next week. At the end of the day, they've told us the data they'll respond to. This is it. It's hotter than expected. Until they turn around and say, yes, but this is the part of the inflation report that we can't really do much about, so we're not going to do anything. That's not where we're at. That's not what they're saying. And that's the reason why people are starting to price in a higher likelihood of a 75 basis point rate hike in November uh, beyond the September, uh, the September meeting. And this really speaks to what the Fed is probably going to signal, which is everything's still on the table. It's not coming down. I, I would enough. note in the last 20 minutes, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index has shown a more accommodative statistic. It's screaming that we need more rate rises out into the future. The S&P right now is negative 2% on the Nasdaq 100. We're down three percentage points. We're about 12 minutes into the session. Yields are much, much higher. We had the pushback from the Federal Reserve 
after the rally of June into July, from mid-June into July and onto August. And then I imagine, <clears throat> I think we're all preparing for the pushback again at next week's meeting after the rally of the previous week or so. Maybe in their silence, the market will start to hear the tea leaves they've been putting out there. I mean, there that seems go. to be where we're at right now because it seems like they won't have to guide the market anywhere if today's whole uh, moves Well, that's, it, that's the whole point of setting out a very clearly clearly communicated reaction function. Yeah. It's that you shouldn't be out there talking all the time. You just have to lay it out and say, this is it. This is how we respond to incoming information. What did Jonathan Goliath Credit Suisse say? Oh, that it's what game the theory. It's I game think it was theory. something that they basically can't, okay. you can't. They can't say that they're not going to hike rates because then the market will become accommodative and then they won't change their goal. Yes, Tom. If Sterling goes through 114, three bedroom, four bath, Beaufort Gardens, Nightbridge. Oh, nice. Like 16 million dollars. Are we sharing that? I think. Yeah, you and You're I can. Know. And, okay. <laughs> you know. You're staying. We're on separate floors. <laughs> of course. Yes. You know, by definition, it's a walk up. Equity's down. 3% on the NASDAQ 100. That's an expensive kind of walkout, Tom. On the S&P 500, we're down more than 2%. The conversation continues. This is Bloomberg. We're seeing hopeful signs of progress on inflation as well. The price of gas, when we said not what I was doing wouldn't make any difference, and guess what? It's down a dollar and thirty cents since the start of the summer and continues to go down. Inflation eased in July. I said last spring that our top economic priority was to bring down inflation without giving up on all the gains American workers made last year. But there's more to do. There's more to do, that's for sure. That was yesterday. We'll hear from the president a little bit later this afternoon after a hot CPI print. I'm sure that David Kelly disagrees with that over at JP Morgan, but most people calling this a hot CPI print in the United States of America. 20 minutes into the session, equities lower by 2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we are lower by more than three percentage points. AMH down in D.C. Anne-Marie, we hear from the president, I believe, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah, that's right. And he's going to be talking about the, quote, Inflation Reduction Act. And we have a time when inflation, as you say, Jonathan, and most of the street believes, is hot right now. And it did come in worse than what was expected. And what the president has been leaning into, as you just heard him just yesterday, talking about the fact that they are seeing inflation starting to quell, he's trying to lean into some of these <clears throat> better economic data points. The one bright spot in this report that the White House is certainly going to spin similar to what the president said yesterday, is the fact that gasoline was above $5 a gallon in June, and right now it's hovering around $3.70. This is good news for this administration. Just last week, we had the biggest drawdown uh, selling in the SPR since the SPR uh, came into uh, fruition, since we had one. It's history. So this is the work they've been doing. But at the same time, how much is he really going to be able to sell this point when you have core inflation higher, when you have food higher, when you have rents higher, and the timing couldn't be worse because obviously we're less than two months away from the midterm elections. Well, and we have seen 90 consecutive days of declining gasoline prices, which really is the heart of what you're talking about, Anne-Marie. But how much further can they really go? Because we were talking earlier with Regina Meyer of KPMG, and she was saying, you know, talking to how low the inventories have gotten and that they've got to start rebuilding, which will probably create the opposite effect. Yeah, I was listening to that interview, and what her concerns are is what I'm hearing from a lot of people in the industry, which is also we need to start refilling the SPR. <laughs> So that could also be good for U.S. oil companies. But I think a big question about that is at what price is the U.S. going to be willing to start buying oil, right? They would want to obviously try to fill it up at a much cheaper uh, price. And the other big question, of course, is that this SPR release they have, and it's been a slow drip in terms of how they do the drawdowns, but it ends in October. So there's a big question of do they slow it down into the winter, or is there going to be a potential another tap of it? Emery Horton, thank you so much from the White House lawn uh, this morning. On Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, we continue with David Kelly of J.P. Morgan. David, I want to go to my chart of the year, which is a comparison of Japan, Europe, and U.S. animal spirit, the nominal GDP. If we get a slower disinflation, if we get an elevated disinflation, how does that change the difference between real GDP and that inflation component. 
What does that mean for the businesses of America? Well, I think both are going to come down. Uh, uh, we're going to get a revision, actually, to the last five years of GDP data. We're going to get that at the end of this month. And it could take away one of the negative quarters we got earlier on this year. So I think growth might have been a little stronger at the start of this year, but it is slowing down. And so we're, you know, I think over the next year, uh, next 12 months, we'll be lucky to get 2% real GDP growth, I'd say closer to 1%, maybe add on another 3% for the GDP wow. deflator. So you're talking about about 4 to maybe a little over 4% nominal GDP growth. That's a lot less than we've been seeing, uh, particularly in the last year. Uh, so nominal GDP growth is slowing down. What that means is lower revenue growth for companies, and that is going to be tough for companies to deal with. Yep. And that's why we're seeing a lot of revenue and earnings downgrades. And we just had a note from Jonathan Golub over Credit Suisse come out and track those downgrades and how they've come in at an accelerating pace. He's still bullish. You've expressed optimism consistently, and I yep. think that this is interesting. What's going to be, and I hate to use this word, but the pivot point for market participants to get more confidence in a rally that is not loved and clearly is quick to reverse on a day like today? Well, I, I think at some stage the Federal Reserve will feel comfortable enough with the progress we're seeing on inflation and scared enough about what's going on with the economy that, that, that they'll signal that their next move is going to be less dramatic than their last move. And as soon as we go from a 75 basis point rise to a 50 basis point rise, then people will begin to figure out that, that this is, you know, that the Fed's going to have to, to turn here. But, but broad, I mean, longer term, do you think that this economy can actually operate with the federal funds rate above 4%? Because I don't. I, I think that longer term, there just isn't enough demand in this economy after years of very low, uh, low interest rates. What, you know, I think that this level of the dollar, this level of mortgage rates, uh, they will t tend to slow this economy down. So I think the Federal Reserve is going to have a very hard time holding the federal funds rate above 4% if they decide to push it there. And that's something else they have to think about. They don't want to be cutting rates next year. The market's actually pricing that in, that they're going to overshoot and have to cut. They don't <clears> want to do that. But if they do go too high, then they'll have to cut next year to stop the economy from going into recession. David Kelly, I've got one final question. You said this was an overreaction. If it is, what would you buy right now? Um, I would. Uh, I, I think I would uh, be a little short the U.S. dollar right now. I think the dollar is is surging too much in this, and I think I would be buying financials and probably tech. I mean, I think that I think that if, if rates, long rates, come down a little bit because people figure the Fed's eventually going to crack here, uh, then I'd, I'd want to get ahead of that trade. David Kelly. Thank you, of JP Morgan Asset Management. Just leading the other way, Tom. We like that, a different view. It was a different view. With an equity view. market Absolutely. down 3% on well, the NASDAQ and down 2% on the S&P. That was a trot down a small street in Boston from 40 years ago of David Kelly at Putnam years ago. And down the road was the legend, Phil Carre of Pioneer Funds. And David channeled Mr. Carre, and trust me, John, it was Mr. Carre, where he talked about declining revenue growth given this cycle. That's what I'm watching for into earnings season into next year. The world changes when you move away from the bright lights of inflation, to borrow from Phil Correa. An equity market that's softer, and Lisa, we've got to talk about a bond market that's softer too. Yields are much, much higher, twos, tens and thirties. This is quite a move off the back of this inflation report on a two-year. Now, you can say the equity market perhaps not an overreaction because we were up 5% over the last four days. So maybe we're taking some of the heat out of that move. But to see yields up 17 basis points on a two year, 373.92 on a two year yield in America. The highest level going back to November of 2007. What's coming clear is that the debate is about whether this economy can withstand 4% interest rates for long enough. And that might be one of the big, that might be one of the big dividers between bulls and bears because people might be able to say the Fed can hold them there for longer than perhaps you think. And that is a bearish case. The bullish case is no, they can't and they'll have to reverse course very quickly. I think you framed that debate perfectly, not just today, but over the last several months, Lisa. We just say thank you to the team again for thank putting you. together this beautiful set with this absolutely beautiful backdrop here in London. We'll be here through the Are rest we of the tomorrow? week. We will be here tomorrow as well. Am I here tomorrow? And I we'll see know. if this equity market so. move sticks. <laughs> You're supposed to be, Tom. On the S&P, we're down 2%. On the Nasdaq 100, we're negative three full percentage points. Live from a beautiful London for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg.